Um, Lucinda, where I thought we could start this morning, um, well, first of all, I want to say that we're here with Lucinda Corn, and today is November 7, 2002. And where I wanted to start this morning is to ask you about your candy making. <laughs> well, that's kind of a hobby. Mm -hmm. And like I say, everything I know about it, I uh, think I learned from my sister, but I don't do anything very well. So we just slap it together. What kinds of candies do you make? Oh, I make turtles. That's Bob's favorite. He say, claims he doesn't like chocolate, but he still likes turtles. And uh, with that, of course, I make caramels to go in the turtles. That's one of the basics. And van vanilla cream centers. There's a French uh, center that I like really, really, very much, but with my hands the way they are, I can't make them anymore. So I don't try to to do those. They're What's very that? hard to you see. You make a, a cream center, and you uh, add whatever you want. Now, they're coconut. I use a lot of coconut in my vanilla cream center. I probably the best cookbook I have ever seen on candy is Pope's. And it was published in, must have been the 50s, maybe even the 40s. And it isn't in print now, at least I haven't been able to get it. The last one I bought, I think I ordered his piece when they were still in Elgin. <laughs> so that's, that's a long time ago. Uh, I don't know what else. I. Uh, I learned a few things from him, and I, I don't dip very well. I don't do anything very well, but I make boxes of candy. Christmas, I've got a group coming in next week. Well, three or four, that's enough in the kitchen. Uh, and I'm going to show them how, because I usually make them for ladies' aid at Christmas time, and they were asking about it. So we're going to start then. This is a little early to start, but uh, you don't want to leave them too long. But I've got a good room in there for candy <laughs> that's always cold this time of year. That's the, which room is that? That e e West room. The, the sitting parlor? Yeah, we aren't, don't use it for anything else. And, Everybody complains when you open the door to put something in, but uh, it's a good place to. You don't have to take a lot of refrigerator space and so on. And of course, they make fudge and nougats and simple things that you just cook one day and eat it that day. <laughs> It's so good. And we, you had also been talking about the, the marble slab that from the courthouse, and you used that in candy making. Could you tell us about that? Also? Yes, I use that for kneading. I use it for fudge now. Well, I think I always have. I never was quite sure, even with the thermometer, whether I got the temperature right with fudge. And it's very important to have it right keep it soft. And uh, I uh, find the marble slab works nicely. You, you, uh, you use a scraper and scrape it up. And just knead it for about 10 minutes. It's the same principle as kneading bread, only you just use a scraper and, and uh, a knife. If I try to make two or three kinds of filling for Creams, I, I could do it, used to be able to do that. I don't do that anymore. I try to limit the time I have to hand spend because everything I do is slower. Mm -hmm. And it will continue, I suppose, yeah. to 
we get slower at July stop. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that slab come from? Where did the marble come from? I have no idea. I. Uh, well, no, I mean, you said it, it came from somewhere here in the county? Oh, it came from the courthouse. Uh, I, I thought you meant where it came from. Uh, where does marble come from? Uh, I think they, a, a lot of the marble is Italian marble. They have quarries in Italy where they um, uh, cut it out from. You think a lot comes from Italy? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Also the markings, like Vermont. They, they say Vermont. Vermont. Yeah. I, uh, the only thing I know about it, we have a, one of these, like like the cake you were talking about, tears, that you put, uh, in the cemetery for my, my family, and it came from Scotland. Now, I don't know anything of, of the history except that. Could, could, could we get rid of that? Piece of paper. Actually, I'm hearing that sound. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> oh. I can hear a little, it sounds like a little mouse. I'm not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm sorry. So the, the marble piece came from? The courthouse. They were um, uh, doing something over, I don't exactly know what. But they had these big marble slabs, and you saw how big it is. It doesn't quite reach the edges, and it's not very handy. It's handy for cooking. Don't put your china on it. <laughs> it breaks easily, or the china breaks easily. But if you uh, use the slab for kneading, and making pies, it's, it's good for that. So it has lots of uses. And you just put it, a um, lot of kitchens are putting it in, in the, uh, I think my daughter said she had one. Mm -hmm. They had built the house recently. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess other people have found that it works. Uh, you always see these marble top tables in the living room or something that I couldn't quite see making fudge and kneading <laughs> on the, in the living room, although I might be tempted at this point. <laughs> that's, a, that's all I know about it. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask if you could tell us again, I mean, we were talking last time a little bit about how the house got built. Uh-huh. And... I was wondering if you could tell us that story again, and um, starting with uh, uh, relating the year that the, this house was built in. Well, it was built in 1850. That is, he started it in 1850, and he fin finished it in 1854. And the ex exterior is... Uh, all the same, really, except for the porch, which was added on in 1925. Now that's the outside I'm talking about, in appearance. It really, you can see in the, the pictures I showed you, that one uh, is much like the 20th century. Wait a minute, was that? Yeah, I guess it was still the 20th century when that was made, but two or three years ago, well, no, 20 years ago, because we gave it to Bob. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure. Well, how, how did he make the bricks? Well, they had a kiln, and I suppose, because I've never seen any evidence of it around here, but they had a kiln that was brought in. And uh, they made the, the bricks just the way they're, I don't know, I don't have the recipe for it. <laughs> Maybe you do. But I think it takes a certain amount of iron to get a good red brick. And Grandfather uh, Corn was not at all happy with the first bricks that they made. They used the slough 
area, which is over, uh, well, near the fence line. There are lots of slurs, but that one was the one that he used. And I think he thought, well, it was covered with trees and probably a lot of undergrowth uh, where they could use it. I don't know how much. He said, a gramophone told me that they made 100,000 bricks before they laid any. But when they started laying them, they found that these were kind of uh, mud colored. They're, you may have seen them in various houses. And uh, he didn't like the color of them. So they went over in back of the big barn and used that field. I often feel sorry for the people who had to count the bricks. <laughs> we had a friend who came here, uh, one of Sally's friends from Oregon, came and <laughs> he counted the, bri the bricks uh, in the north end. And now I can't remember, and he can't remember either how many he counted. <laughs> but it, he actually did it mathematically like you would, but he couldn't even remember what he, he had said, and I didn't write it down. So we didn't think it was that important, but now I'm curious. <laughs> uh, that's what happens to you when you get involved in things like that. The house itself is interesting. Um, I, they did not build the house all at once. They kind of did it in, sta they built it in stages. I, as far as I can tell, I would say they must have built the skeleton. The, the east wing and the west wing do not have basements under them. And the kitchen didn't until, um, I think Bob was in high school, in the 20s. He and the hired man dug out these, what they called, in my day, uh, bigger. The big stones were the foundation, and they brought out these two big stones. That was one of our favorite stories, because when we moved up here, Dave was only four, and the other kids were a little bit older, but we had a lot of toys. And uh, Grandma had used the one room in the basement for fruit, so we took the fruit out. Well, the fruit was pretty well gone, but we took out everything there. But we tried to move these stones. Niggerheads is the term they used back in those days. Uh, but if they, uh, it, they couldn't get them through some of the doors because they're too big to go through the doors. So they'd have to go the long way around. So the story was that if we didn't have anything else to do that day, the men would work on the, <laughs> the, moving the stones from about the same time we had to put a new furnace in. <laughs> so there were all those things to do. And there's still th things that we aren't doing but wish we could. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to tell us a little about, well, well bef uh, another question about the house. Did they hire a mason to help lay the bricks? Do you know about that? I have no idea about that. I, I mm -hmm. have no training. I wish I had brought the paper. When you see the prices, or I've got it somewhere, but did, I'd have did, to. Um, Mr. Did Robert Corrin, the great grandpa Robert Corrin, keep a, a record of what he spent on things? Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of uh, several account books. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting because in the 1940s, uh, I think they were paying $4 for 100 pounds of beef. Or something like that, and it's it's just kind of an amazing. I believe they bought six chickens 
for twenty dollars. They probably didn't buy them all at once. No, it was, it was less than that. I I meant to to say that because it it, it is important. I saved it, but uh, maybe we could right pull, now we, now I can't. We could pull that out sometime and take a closer look at that. That would be very yeah, interesting. Yeah, it it's a uh, and labor and like a dollar a day for a team. Uh, it it was uh, a different time. Um, something else I wanted to ask you was uh, if you could tell us about the Koran Church, what the story is to the church. Well, it was a neighborhood church, and it it was very close to our line, and the. Uh, the Plato Township line, and I I showed you the picture, and I have the of the paper I found in the in amongst the letters from the Civil War, and it didn't I show you that picture? I'm, I'm not sure I've seen that. No. Mm. Bob, yeah. did you get that picture? Of the the uh, Hampton Plato Fifteenth Caval Cavalry. Oh, the oh the list. All the ladies that did this list of where all the the different battles they fought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, that, that oh, is, you know what I mean. Yeah. Where is it? It's in back of the bed in the uh, my room there. The head. You you put things <laughs> wherever. I have a, a lot of big, uh, not a lot, but a few big atlases. And I don't know if you're familiar with the 1871 atlas. Of, I've seen reprints of that. Well, the reprints are so nice and handy. But here's this big, mine was my grandfather's, and it has just gone to pieces. But that is one of the things that I think we ought to send to a museum. But uh, I love this Pea Ridge. <laughs> and he, I think in one of these letters. He, And just set it um, down over there would be fine. Thanks, Bob. But it, it looks like they might have used some of this lettering that they used for bags and things like that back in, I'm sure, in, at Garfield, you've seen a lot of that sort of thing. Otherwise, I, I don't know. It's kind of a, a parchment. And it was all folded, as you can see, when it was in this box of letters. And um, I pulled it out. I think I had just found it. And Eve was here one time, Larry, uh, Jerry's mother-in-law. And she said, oh, you should take care of that. You should straighten it out. <laughs> well, I, we have lots of old picture frames. One thing about the family, they did ta have a lot of pictures taken. I mean, pictures of the of the uh, senior members of the family. Anyway, um, uh, that's that's why it's framed, because you told me to. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. And I just knew it was interesting, and uh, but I think it's very definite. Definitely made. You see, it's the uh, Plato and Campton. I think the church at that time was uh, not here. It was, um, I think they worshipped in the, what they call the Stone Schoolhouse, which is a little bit east of Cor on Corn Road, on, not on Corn Road, on Silver Glen Road east of Corn, about a half mile. And I think that was 
the I think the stone part, it wasn't a stone building, as I understand it. It was a, the name of a family who lived there. But I had to get an atlas to find that out. Anyway, uh, I'm di digressing, but I don't, <laughs> don't know exactly where you want me to stop. Because um, it was not unusual in the 1840s when, when um, people were just getting settled in this area that initially they were worshiping in schoolhouses. Schoolhouses, we have first homes, yeah. log cabins, and yeah. then they would go on to possibly schoolhouses. Uh, actually, the Methodist Church in Plato was, well, Later they built this one here as a, a branch of it. And then there was another one uh, on, uh, in East Burlington. And there were th the three churches. And they always got somebody from Garrett Seminary as a, as a pastor. He'd go from these churches. And when they come out on, on the train. So it was early in the 20th century, I think, when when uh, they had these churches. Well, then when cars came in, people could go to the denomination they wanted to, and um, the poor little country churches, many of them closed up, just as the corn church did, I think. I think some of the material from the corn church went to uh, South Elgin Methodist Church. And the Burlington, I suppose, East Burlington, probably a lot of it went to the Burlington Church. And I don't know all those things, I'm guessing. But uh, that's pretty much the way it happened. But my mother-in-law, who was born in the late 80s, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. But anyway, she said that she was confirmed in the uh, Plato Church, but it was a Lutheran service. The Methodist Church in, at, in Plato was the only one in Plato of that nature. But at, the, at that time, apparently, they were still sharing buildings. And that, that would be, as I say, in the, almost the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And then when the railroads came in, that made so much a difference. If, you, if you're interested um, in railroads, and if you're interested in roads, they make such a difference. Now, uh, for example, Wasco wasn't there until the railroad went through in the late 90s. Plato was there, but they moved the town down <laughs> to meet the railroad. But where the cemetery is, if you know Plato at all, it, the cemetery is, the church now is across from it. It used to be a part of the, the uh, place. The church there was built in 1859. So, um, as I say, railroads did make a lot of difference. Most of the back, what we call the back towns in Kane County, you know what I mean by back towns, um, away from the river, and, and most of them were, uh, might have different denominations, but they, in horse and buggy, you couldn't go that far to, to do the whole bit. So that's why the big change came in the after the automobile came into being. Does that answer? Oh, that's a very interesting perspective. Thank you. Um, you were showing at, uh, last time after uh, Dave left. You were showing me the window from the um, mm -hmm. Corn Church. Um, would you mind if we if we brought that in? Yeah, you know where it is. Yeah. Let me go get that. 
And I don't, don't move very well, as you may have observed. This is such a lovely, um, lovely artifact here. You want me to hold it? Oh, I'll kind of hold I'm not in the picture here, am I? Wait a minute. I don't need to be in it. I don't know. Is that the right side or is the other? I never did know. I tried to clean it up, but I didn't want to mm -hmm. change the wood. Um, it was in, an inside window. Uh, the doors had, I think this had about six or seven. And in the process, they were stored out in the barn here. Um, then they took the church down. And uh, we got three whole ones. I cut it, my son and, and uh, his friend worked on it. <laughs> Christmas, before Christmas, Christmas Eve day. Anyway, he did a, a big, <laughs> don't fall in the, it will probably hurt you much more than. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to break anything. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we, I gave one to, to Flora, Bob's sister, and what do I mean, I gave them, <laughs> because they weren't mine to give, but, but he got three out, and one went here, and one went to the Nortons, and um, I imagine Barbara Thames probably has it. She lives up near Hampshire, but, uh, and I imagine Flo uh, Dorothy took hers with her to Alabama. <laughs> so they're traveling around if, if they took them. I'm not altogether sure that, <laughs> that they would, maybe just a piece of junk, but uh, to the family they meant a lot. Um, when the church first got started, uh, Mr. Corrin donated the land and allowed the mm -hmm. neighbors to build the church. How, how did that work? I'm not sure. He had a, a list. I'm not sure even where that is. But I think the church cost something like $2,000. It was built in 1985, and it had no basement under it. What, what year was it built, Lucinda? I'm sorry. 18, <laughs> 1885. Taken down in, um, I think it was 1927, either 27 or 29, I'm not sure which. Bob told me that I'd forgotten the story of my life. <laughs> What I find interesting about that is how it relates to um, the stories you've told me about the reason why Robert Corn left Virginia to begin with. Apparently he was a very religious man. And uh, wh wh why did um, old uh, senior Robert Corn? why did he leave Virginia? Well, it was a time for people moving out. and. If you've been in that part of the country, are you familiar with Greenbrier County or it? Um, what is? I'm trying to think of the name of the county, and I, I or the not the county, but they have this big hotel. I don't know what it's good for, but every president has stayed there. And they go there for treatments of some kind or another. Do you know what it is? Yeah. Uh, it's something hot springs, uh, or is it green? It sounds like it seemed green to me dryer. it had something to do with salt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I know where you're talking about. I don't remember the name. Well, uh, that's better than I do. <laughs> I've actually stayed there. That's what I mean. So I know. I should remember. It wasn't called Greenbrier? Uh, no, yeah, it was called the Greenbrier Hotel. Oh. The, the Greenbrier. Okay. And it, uh, we were there 
we went looking for relatives, but we got a little confused because the name of of the relative went further than we we knew. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting when you, when you go in and look. I think I told you that we just got in touch with what would have been my grandfather's, my husband's grandfather. Um, half-sister who is descended from a first marriage. And the family we met um, and spent a little time with, we weren't there very long, but um, were Corns. And he was a, a workman in the Greenbrier Hotel. And I think it, his whole past had been in that. Now that's, you mentioned why did they come west? I think always looking for something better. Looking, and a 19-year-old uh, didn't have a much future there. I don't know if any of you remember, but I remember about, it seems 30 or 40 years ago, or you wouldn't remember, but um, there was an attempt made to give the land away in Alaska. And not many farmers took him up on it. Well, if a farmer was settled here, the prospect of going to Alaska and leaving his home and all the things was what, what all these immigrants did from every country they came. They left families behind. In many cases, my my grandfather, Muirhead, twin brother, went to New Zealand. And so it, they were always moving and going on. And I think that was always ahead of them. Maybe it'll be better there. Like he looked at a house in Virginia and said, if I ever make it big, I'll make a house like, I'll build a house like that. <laughs> I, I'm sure I told you that story because that was one of the favorite stories of the family. But uh, I, I, I don't know any particular reason. Did he get along with his father? I have no idea. Okay. There may have been family problems, I don't know. But uh, so far as I, the big family, he might not have gotten along with some of his brothers. <laughs> it's pretty hard to tell. And he was the youngest. And so if there was anything to be gotten uh, in the way of help, he might be the last to get it. And so he just looked ahead. Well, his, his next oldest brother had gone to Niles, Michigan first, before he came here. And uh, it, it just seems like nobody had very much. And they all had big families. And so they wanted the best for their families. And they moved on. It's a story of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wherever you go under any conditions, you're always looking to improve a lot of your family. At least that's what we, we always hope that we're going to do. Okay. Um, we have Thanksgiving coming on pretty soon. Yes. Um, what I think you had mentioned that um, you have some uh, letter from Myron Amick uh, talking about President Lincoln uh, uh, commemorating the first Thanksgiving. No, I don't think it was the first. Wait a minute, maybe it was. I'm not sure which letter it's in. I've got quite a few obit obituaries of the family that... Uh... Now, what is that you're holding, Lucinda? What do you have in your hands there? It's a book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our family history. 
that I Is that something you wrote? Who, who, mm -hmm. wrote, who wrote the book? Yeah, I guess most of it's it's written by people. Let's see. These letters are all special. Just for example, I've waited so long and patiently for answers to my letters to Myron, that was my father-in-law, uh, that I had quite despaired of ever hearing from any of you. Again, I wrote to Myron once from San Francisco and once from Honolulu, just after I got out of the hospital there. And I have sent papers from here a couple of times. So when I received a letter from you last, last, last week, I was surprised and pleased too. For even if you all seem to forget me, I can never forget you folks. Our chances for letter writing out here in the country are not what they used to be when we were quartered in barracks in uh, Manila. He, he, he was still in the army. Here we uh, used to be when we quartered in barracks. Wait a minute. Here we are living in little pup tents, just big enough for two to crawl into. We must carry everything with us when we move, for with our guns, belts, haversacks, I don't know what they are. Okay. Canteen, blankets, and half a tent um, to carry, to say nothing of 200 round, rounds of ammunition and a shovel, axe, or pick to carry. If you can only bring yourself to imagine that, you can readily believe that outside of a few pieces of extra clothes, we have little room or strength either for anything unnecessary. Now that's the life of a, a soldier. I don't know too much about his, his life, but it was letters like that that kind of make me see a whole different side. I. Uh, I like the book we have. It's the history of the 36th Regiment of Illinois Volunteers during the War of the Rebellion by L. G. Ben Bennett, William Haig. I guess. Anyway, it was published in Aurora, Illinois, by Nick Knickerbocker and Heather, Printers and Binders, 1876. And I took different things out of that book. Uh, this was um, an article in uh, from the book about Lookout Valley. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but in connection, I guess I had to get this. Lookout Mountain, I always thought, was in Tennessee. And some of his letters said Tennessee. But then he had an address, Lookout Mountain, or Lookout Valley, and it was in Alabama. So they were very close to the line. Um, now, where was I? What was I looking for to start with? Oh, you were talking about Thanksgiving. Well, this is part of it. I don't. I don't know if this is. It's written January nineteenth. 1863. I have lately received a letter from Mother, and by it I learn that Addie has written to me and have not gotten any answer. I have written, but I see that you have not received mine either. I have not heard from you for some time, but I am very anxious to hear. I suppose the reason why our letters did not reach their destination is owing to the inconsistency of the mails, which have been captured several times by the guerrilla Morgan. So, uh, you know, Morgan's writers was who went through, especially through that, that part of, uh, that they were in. But there weren't many of them, so they didn't stay long in one place, I guess. Anyway, so this clears up the mystery. I'm in hopes you get, may get this. I'm happy to inform you that through the goodness of God I am alive and enjoying good health. 
hoping that these few lines will find you all enjoying the same blessing. I suppose you have heard of the Battle of Murfreesboro by this time. I was present during the whole engagement, which lasted five days. Uh, my pen is too weak to describe the sufferings which the battlefield presented. Just imagine that the effects of five days of hard fighting would amount to when every man struck with the determination to kill. Our brigade was stationed on the right wing, and he goes on to describe the Battle of uh, Murfreesboro, which you may remember from history. If any, No, I guess they don't teach any battles anymore, do they? Anyway, now this is the part I think you were interested in. I received your long look. This was March 3rd, 19, 1863. I received your long looked for letter a few days ago. I was glad to hear from you all once more, to hear that you had been spared from the tortures of sickness. The soldiers in one of the regiments of this brigade have erected an arbor of cedar trees, which constitutes our meeting house. The seats are not so soft as those of the fine churches in the cities, but we are glad to have the privilege of even to stand up in order to hear the gospel preached. Today is Sunday, and the minister spoke plain and in an interesting manner. One cannot help looking with the greatest of interest upon a congregation of soldiers collected around their chaplain to hear the word of God and to hear them join in singing praises to God. Although it is unaccompanied by the sweet musical voice of a sister or some female friend, it is melodious to the ear. In accordance with the President's proclamation, that Thursday, the 30th of April, should be observed in the Army as a day of fasting and prayer. Now that is the reference I think he referred to. We surely stand in need of the prayers of all good Christians. As the Holy Bible tells us that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Then why should not every true Christian who feels for the interest of their country join in the supplications to the Redeemer of mankind that he will cease this wicked war and have peace and harmony and reign once more in our midst? Yes, underlined, the country, soldiers, and friends appeals to all Christians at home to use all their influence at the throne of grace for the cause that they are contending for. I could read the whole, whole thing. <laughs> I'm sure you'd find it interesting, but you've read it before, so you know what I mean. That's lovely, Lucy. Uh, but I, I think that's what you were yes, that asking was the, about. Yes, that was the reference I was thinking of. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm always impressed. I was impressed with his, his writing. Missed some misspelled words, of course, and I didn't correct them. I put them in here as he, he had written them. At, at, at the time I did this, there was no such thing as um, the written word showing me his writing. Now when I think of all the things, I have a whole bunch of letters if you're ever interested in just reading them. I, their copies. Uh, I'll be glad to let you take them. They're, uh, as I say, to me, very inspiring. They just, we take for granted so many things. And when you think of what these fellows went through in the war, and he, he describes it in pretty vivid detail. And all words are pretty much the same, I guess. But we do get much better coverage, I guess. But but there, I had, I had forgotten the reference to Lincoln. But um, um, let's see. Something else I wanted to ask you was if you could um, talk to mm -hmm. us about some of the barns here on the farm. About what? The, the barns, the outbuildings. Oh. Well, 
the first barn I think I mentioned is a part uh, that is, it wasn't the first one, I'm sure, because there were log cabins and there were, there was a log cabin. And there was, uh, in, uh, not in that picture, but in the other one, it shows the outbuildings. And I don't know anything about them. That is, most of the barns here were built in 19, around 1915. Uh, the, uh, if you know anything about, I can't tell you the names of them, but if you know anything about the structure of the barns where there's a sla straight roof, which was pretty common in the first, the first one. But then, then uh, when addition was put on in 1915, the other end of what we call the cow barn was, had what, I think they called it a hip roof or something. I have books on farms and I haven't read much about them. Can't even remember the names of the houses that I'm interested in. But um, that, that was put on at about around the same time the horse barn was put on. The horse barn is the one that has our name on it. I imagine they'll be changing that pretty soon. <laughs> but uh, it, it was there as long as I've ever been around. So I guess Grandfather was <laughs> rather proud of it. Anyway, he, um, we had a, now the two, I know that the, the corn crib was built in 19, the new modern corn grub. I think I told you in connection with that, somebody bought it from St. Charles. I think it was built in 1960. If you knew Frank Richmond, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, well, I think that was the last piece of, of uh, building that he really superintended. The um, chicken house, I'm sure, dates back to 1915, ready to fall down. And the, I suppose the pig house was, was built along in that same period. In the early days of the, the 20th century, you would had most of those buildings going up. Now the Morton buildings, the big one was, I guess, the last area we could find, and they needed more room for tractors and so on. The more equipment you had, the more buildings you needed. And so that was built. Do you remember the year they, they had the big snowstorm? that the roofs went in, I think it was 80, 88? Uh, I thought 79. 79, I think, they, I think you're right. The lat, they had just built the big barn just before that snowstorm. That is the big Morton building. And the uh, snowstorm brought in the roof of our hitherto, what we thought was a very fine building in good shape, was used for equipment, to keep equipment in. Um, and it had a slanting roof. Well, a snowstorm came and Bob came in for milking, and he said, have you looked out the window? And I said, no. He said, the roof's in. So they spent days taking that up, and then they built the second Morton building. I, it was a year later, I think, than the other one. And that's a history of, of the barns. I mean, that's all I know about them. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure the boys could tell you a lot more. 
Only the thing that was distressing about that for me, the tractor was new the year before, <laughs> and it hit the steering rod. And that, and also, we have a cutter. You know what a cutter is. Uh, snow. Anyway, I think the dashboard on that was destroyed. But otherwise, it didn't hurt the other machines that were in there. That was lucky. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes things are lucky. Yeah. Um, because the house here is so old, I, it was not built in the 1840s with modern plumbing. When, when were um, bathrooms added, and mm -hmm. how many and where? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't think I ever heard. A lot of things were done. Now, I think the hardwood floors here in the house were put in let's see the air floor was married. I'm not sure, but uh, it could have been in that particular time. I'd be about nineteen thirty five or Something like that. And I think everything that could be modernized was modernized at that time. But I would think things like the bathroom had been done much before that. I, I'm just guessing because I don't know. The bathroom was originally a part of the, the um, that is downstairs, a part of the... Um, Garage, what we call a garage now, but if you if you look at the the things, the bricks are raw. I mean, they aren't lined on the, on this side, and on the inside, it's uh, I don't know what kind of wood it is, but it, it's just a thin wall that separates the garage from the rest from the bathroom. Is it just the one bathroom in the house, Lucinda? No, we have two bathrooms. And where's the other one? The other one's upstairs. In the, it um, was used, as, I think Bob said he used this as a, as a bedroom when he was a boy. So. So they, com they converted the bedroom into a bath? Mm -hmm. Must be a pretty good sized bathroom, actually. Not really. No. It was a small bedroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> In fact, uh, upstairs we have our bedroom was like this, the same size as this. It has a fireplace in it. And off that, which was so common in those days, was a smaller bedroom. And my uh, daughter had that room when she was here. But she had to go through our room to get there. And those were the only two. In the hallway, there's, and I think they probably were there originally, closets. Of course, they've long since gotten rid of all the, the hardware, or what do you call it? The hooks and things that were there. We have hooks still in this room here, which was one time used as a bedroom. There were quite a few people in the family at, at one time. So, and there are two smaller rooms to the, to the back, but the, they're both small. Both have small beds and then narrow. Uh, One's an antique and the other's just a plain twin bed size. Um, 
I'm, I'm kind of curious about the garage or, or the carriage house. Well, there's, a, there's an outside entrance to it. That is, you go down a steps and you're into the basement. But at that time, the basement wasn't very big either. When you stop to think of the size of the house, the basement, the east room is still a crawl space, and that's still a crawl space. Uh, in the West Room. So you can figure that the original basement was uh, that room would have been the, in it. But that's just a small room. Sewing room. Bob tried for years to, to get a bathroom fixed in there. And everybody come in and look at it and shake their heads. <laughs> no way. So it's a room without a, bat a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Otherwise a perfectly beautiful room because it has three, three windows which stop everything else and of course enough furniture to worry about. So. It's, it's not easy to make it. On the other hand, I find the house, I can't ever complain about it. Um, you don't do anything without a stepladder. With windows that size, it's a big chore. But uh, otherwise, it, now like we have, have a bathroom right outside the, the kitchen. But we have a couple of steps. And when I broke my hip, that was a real chore to get down there. Now I've got all these rods and stuff that help me get around better, a little better. I can get around pretty well any place in the house without a problem. It's when I go out, I'm a nuisance. I'm a nuisance anyway because I find I depend on people much more than I should. But oh, I think you're doing just fine, Lucinda. You're doing great. It's good you can move around like you can. Well, I'm thankful. Yeah. The Lord's been good to me. I had a, I had a wonderful husband and a wonderful family. And now since I found all these other members, I feel as though it's kind of enlarged. I just, my run regret is as Bobby and get to meet more of them. We did get to meet this, this one Corin, uh, who would be a half something or other. Um, but he, uh, his ancestor had made the the woods for golf, and they said uh, that in uh, they they thought that uh, Greenbrier County or Louisville, I'm not sure which uh, the the hotel of the course is there. Now I didn't didn't get in the hotel. I don't know what it was like. Whether it was real old. But so many things are old in the East that this probably has, was pretty well made and, and uh, is, is still standing. It, as I say, it's still a popular uh, place for vacations and things. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you a little more about the garage. Um, from things I've been reading in the history that you wrote, um, mm -hmm. things about the house, that there's a, a bake oven out there and that they used to use uh, part of it for um, uh, wood storage in the winter time. And then there's a little room for uh, collecting ashes for soap making. And then also uh, a portion of it was used for smoking meat. Is that? I have no idea. No? 
I don't remember even writing anything like that. Oh, you don't? Okay, well. But I know there was, there were, there were a couple little rooms, and we had paint in one of them, and they did bake once a week. I, I showed, showed you the, not the tins, the iron uh, pans. Uh, that they said they used to use out there, and there was some kind of an oven. But aside from that, I guess the thing I was most impressed with, maybe because Bob was the uh, um, license collection. He has everything from way back when. We used to go out when we had a day off, <laughs> I I usually went with him. And when we were living here, I didn't have to worry about it, at least at first, because Grandpa was always here. But uh, on the other hand, when we were in the first 10 years, I could just bundle the kids up and take them with me if they were little. And if not, I knew they were in school. so. I was really freer, in a sense. And then when we moved in here, it was a little more difficult because we had Iron Man. And uh, there were six beds in the wash every week. <laughs> so I was thankful for automatic washers and all the things. The first six months, I went back. I called up a home and did I was the only one that felt bad about moving, I guess. The kids were so used to Grandma and her doing everything, and they were a little bit like Bob, glad to get home. <laughs> so the moving was quite a thing. But we had a lot of time. I, Cal didn't move in until, you know, almost a year later. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little more um, specifically about the house, Lucinda. Um, do you know where on the property they found the clay to make the bricks, and then how many bricks they made? Well, they had a kiln come in. And they uh, originally, I think, it, grandfather probably by this time was farmer enough to know that the slough back here, which has all the trees and stuff in it, was not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, for a farmer. So they went back there and tried to make bricks. And they ended up with these kind of, uh, oh, they're blah looking, kind of grayish, brownish. They aren't, they aren't a good red. And so they went back of the horse barn, no, the cow barn, out in the, in the east field. And uh, took the land from there. And there's something about bricks, I don't know enough about it, but that you have to have quite a bit of iron in the soil. Now, whether that was the reason that these are so much better colored. So what they did was, in the laying of the bricks, they laid, they took the, the bricks they had already made that they weren't too satisfied with. And they put them in the, you, I don't know if you noticed the size of the walls, the thickness, I think you can see. I don't, you can't see it from here. There, you can see that door. And that's, that's the thickness of the walls all the way through. So, uh, not all the way through, not in the kitchen. That's why I say, I think it was kind of like the old summer kitchen idea that you had this in introducing the people and they used it in the summer. 
But in this case, it was well enough built, and of course it had brick on the outside. But we, it doesn't have the high ceilings, which I guess is a blessing. But we always had trouble with the ceilings. But I think it was because there was no roof over it. I mean, where you have the, another story. But see, that's kind of like this porch out here. But that's just the conclusion I've drawn from that, that, that it was kind of an added on thing. And as I say, the windows, the window, I should say, there's only one window there. Along with that, I probably should mention this. Uh, they were very devout Christians. And in uh, one of my Amy, Myron Amy's letters, I found this so very interesting. He had mentioned the fact that uh, Abraham Lincoln, during the war, this was while well, he was away fighting, and I'm sure he must have seen a lot, but they, he had mentioned the fact that Abraham Lincoln had declared a, a day of prayer, and he felt that all good Christians should be praying for the end of the war and so on. And also, he... Uh, he remembered the old days in Campton when he he sat in the church. He told how this might have been in another letter, but he he told how it meant so much to him to be in the church where they where they worshipped. Uh, and if I I think they called it. A, old stone school, but before the church was built, there, there was supposed to be, I think Dave said he, he showed somebody uh, the stones up in the woods where the church stood. And I suppose they spent like $2,000 or so for the church. Uh, I think he had a, I found a bill or something had something to it. There was no basement under it. And uh, there's a window in the dining room we took from the inside. I think it was kind of an inside doorway. And they had this six or seven panels. And Dave and his friend did some dividing up of the of the door and gave one, one window to... Uh, Dexter, and one to uh, Cal. See, Flora was, it was actually given to Flora, I guess. But we gave them, each one of them, so each one of us had a window. But they had been over in the old house, and all kinds of things happened when you just put things away like that. And uh, what denomination, the, the windows come from the church? Was the uh, these, windows these windows did. And... What denomination was the church? It was Methodist. And my father remembered coming here. He didn't didn't remember the corns, I don't think, really. But that was when they'd take a buggy and and take them because there was a, a church in uh what are they called? East Burlington. But they called it the Harden Church. Now, what the Harden Church stood for, I never did find out. But that was about five or six miles west of here, at least, on uh, the McDonald Road. I don't know that these roads were all named like that at that time, but they are now, so you could find it. And... Uh, that was what one church, and then the main church was in Plato, uh, Plato Center. But it was in the uh, old part of Plato Center, before the railroads went through. If you notice these back towns, most of them changed when the railroads went through. And Plato moved a half mile west, 
Now I guess it's moved back to the... <laughs> Everything's changed again. I suppose when you said, what, what have I seen changing? All the roads have changed so much. One of the interesting things about history, I find, is to see the direction the roads used to take. And, and now, you know, with Garfield Cemetery and all the trouble they're having about that. Well, when we used to go to my grandmother, we'd go down to Mongerson's, turn left, go about a six, sixteenth of a mile, I guess, and, and then go on Garfield Road, and then turn right and go back to where Beath Road comes in and follow Beath Road. Up. We only did that when the weather was pretty bad or something, but Christmas just sometimes. And but, how long ago was that, that you would take that kind of a route? Well, I suppose I was a kid. I was a kid once, <laughs> quite a long time ago, but I, uh, and was that by I would think it was in the 1920s. We had a car when we took that way. When we had to go with a sleigh or something for Christmas, we would go down to the Burlington, to the, what is now Silver Glen, to Swanberg Road, you know where Swanberg Road is? And then we'd go back to Lily Lake, and that was, what, Canada Corners. I'm sure you've heard of all these things. And then we'd go back Hanson Road to Anderson Road. And my grandmother lived just a stone's throw or so from the house of the cupola is still there. A cousin of mine is living in it now. And, uh, but that was the route we took. That was the shortest route. I think. I'm not sure. But the, you followed the road wherever it went. But then somebody was just asking me about how roads were, and I just wonder if a lot of these roads didn't have curves in them and stuff because there were trees fell and they turned up and went around and you had a big departure from it. Now, I guess you have to use your imagination when you think of history and how it's repeating because it never repeats exactly the same. And I'm sure our ancestors would have just collapsed to see the big network of roads that we have all over the country. But Could you talk about when electricity first came to this area? Who? Electricity, when they electrified. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we got ours in, I, I'm speaking from my own personal experience because I don't really know, of course I guess you could gather that by this time, but I don't really know when the corns got it. I think they got it a little later than we did, but it was in around 1930. And uh, in our case, we lived about a mile and a half from the main road, off the main road. And I remember they were, my folks were quite shocked to think that they had to pay $11 a month for electricity. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the neighbors who lived beyond us didn't have to pay that much when they got it a little later, but they didn't get it when we did. And actually, you had, was a part of the process of building the line. Now that may be just a Scotch story. <laughs> Everybody has stories, I guess. But uh, I remember that. And I remember Cal telling, 
about coming home from school and the house is all lit up. And when you, when you see what happens when the electricity goes off, we haven't had that problem of late because um, with the dairy, we've had a generator for quite a few years. But and we still have a little stove in the that we burn papers and stuff in. In the kitchen? Where is this? No, it's off the kitchen. Just across from the bathroom. It's, but uh, when we when we moved down here, I don't know if you met my mother, my nephew when he came in. He said, <laughs> he told how my sister had said, and he still got that old cook stove <laughs> in the kitchen, and it was a dirty thing because you know how the fire boxes would burn out. <laughs> I was always cleaning up after the the firebox because it wasn't very good. But my mother was sick that year and I used to get put things in the in the oven. It would they wouldn't burn. <laughs> They'd have all my do it. So I'd go up and, and clean her house up and uh, sort of hit or miss. But anyway she it was just one of those things that you lived with, but Grandpa loved it. He'd come out in the fall. He was, he was in his, yeah, he was 80, I think, when Grandma died. And so he, he just loved that old cook stove. And I can remember, I think he cried when they took it out. He went in his room, that room in there is a kind of a history room. You know all the stuff in there. Now it's my room because I don't go up and downstairs. I don't go any, any place very well. So when did you, you remodeled the kitchen here if the kitchen had pretty much been original in its original state? Oh no, I would say the kitchen. I, Grandma had the window, the little window that's above the, the counter there. Uh, she had that in there. Now, I don't know why, but when we first moved, they had a lot of, of these antique cupboards. Most of them are out in the garage. <laughs> but we had two or three of those in the pantry. A and, uh, of course, the bathroom was put on. That took part of the garage. And Bob's office, which now has a computer in it, uh, is uh, a part of the garage. But uh, otherwise, any changes have been made. I remember a man, he was a friend of Bob's, came from Geneva, who was in Ivan something. He was from Europe. And he was admiring our old house. And he said, uh, but he said, and at that time we had, uh, rugs that didn't cover the whole thing. And he said, but the first thing I'd do is to get rid of those hardwood floors. <laughs> I said, over my dead body. <laughs> if you ever had to clean the the big wide boards. <laughs> but we have all hardwood floors, except in the kitchen where it's linoleum. But uh, otherwise the house had all, all the wide boards. So under the carpeting here, it's still the wide plank floor? No, no, under the carpeting here is the hardwood. The hard, so it's the... the yeah, floor. people tell me that we should not cover the hardwood, but they have not lived in a house with 12-foot ceilings and, and uh, a cold wind that blows in from the southwest. Our best room in the house. It's great in the summer. We have, I think you probably read it in the history, 40 doors and windows in the house. And, uh, but that includes, like that room in there has 
you really should look at it to appreciate it because it, it, it is a beautiful room. But it comes October, you're glad to shut the door. And that's the enclosed, the enclosed room you're talking about. I mean, this this room that we're sitting yeah. on. Yeah. If you want to step step up, just open the door. Oh, okay. You can look at it. You see what I mean, because. Oh my. Oh, I see what you mean. And it's great when you're entertaining, and I don't do much of it anymore, but. Used to do a lot of it. Um, and it, it makes it it makes the whole house look bigger and better if you can keep the door open, get it back, and and hide some of the work that the kids have done on the not just the kids, I guess all the adults. When you stop to think that. All the wood, the framework, but the they, you better set that. You'd be getting a draft on you. Thank you. You may have to. Our doors are well, a little get, iffy. You have to get the latch just right. That's uh -huh. the way it is with older doors, right? Definitely, <laughs> everything's with, like older people. <laughs> Everything kind of wears out. But, but I thought that would give you an idea of how much that meant to the house. But when we moved in here, uh, they had been, just been using it um, as a uh, bedroom. But in the summertime, that, that's fine. You've got all this air, the, as I say, all the doors, three doors in the room and five windows. And you get a nice southwest wind. <laughs> it's a great place to keep your candy when you're making it <laughs> in, in the wintertime. But you hurry in and you hurry out. <laughs> um, how would you describe that room, Lucinda? Was it originally meant as the yeah, it is part of it. to the house? It was a part of the house. Well, you can see in the, in the pic, not in that picture, but in that one. Right. Oh, it's one But of you see, it has no, it has no basement under it, and it has no uh, uh, story under it. Our our house actually stops at this wall. So, the cold air does come in there. But do you suppose originally that was intended as like the fanciest parlor, the sitting parlor? In yeah, I'm sure. But I imagine they found out very early that with these cold winds, you had to shut it up. Uh, th that one on the east is the same thing, except that we've always used it, and then it has the kitchen over it. But now it was used in this sense. When, when Grandpa Cora and I, I remember when I'd come here, um, Grandpa uh, always shut the door after him. And when we moved in, we had to explain to Dave, he was only four, that that was off limits. But Dave would get Grandpa's Montgomery Ward catalog or Sears Roebuck catalog, <laughs> pick out his Christmas presents. <laughs> Grandpa helped it. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever got anything, <laughs> but uh, it was it was worth trying. <laughs> but the other the other two, Bob was nine. He had his ninth birthday in the basement here. Bob, oh, that was the ping. Pong, oh, if you're talking about how the ping pong room was a great room when Bob was in high school. That's my husband. Uh, he and the hired man dug out under the basement. And they took out what is a basis of our basement, really, these great big stones. And uh, back in the old days, we used to call them niggerheads. 
you've heard that expression, but now you don't do it. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, when we first moved up here, we took one room, and we had a furnace, uh, although Grandma Corn was still, what did they call it? You had a furnace, but you had to tend to it. And, uh, like a coal furnace or a bo uh, boiler? A what? A, a boiler that you'd have to shovel the coal into, that kind of furnace? Uh, every so often, I think they had, I'm not sure. Oh, there was a name for it, too, but I can't think of it. A, a stoker, basically? A stoker. If that, if that was, I'm, I'm sure that was, and I don't, I don't know how it worked, but we had the furnace put in. See, we moved in in, in uh, September. Grandma died in July, and it took Grandpa the day six weeks to decide whether he could put up with three little kids. <laughs> and I know it couldn't have been easy, but uh, he had his own room, and it, it was a sanctuary. He could go in there and, and know that he wouldn't be interrupted except on occasion when Dave would. But uh, the ping pong room was when the kids were growing up. Well, Bob liked ping pong, and then Cal came along, and Cal got really pretty good at ping pong. And so we did use the basement a lot. We aren't using it now. It's not in very good shape. The ping pong tables. <laughs> have just disintegrated like everything else if you don't use them. So that's a part of the history I'd rather not repeat. <laughs> but but it's what happens when things change too much. You, you were saying that um, when your husband was in high school, he helped dig out part of the basement? I think he was out of high school. Uh -huh. As I said, I think I told you that Cal was born when Bob was in high school. So I think he and the hired man dug it out. And they had these big, big stones that I was telling you about. And one's behind a door, and the other's near a little wall that's in there. But they, I, I used to say when we first moved up here, they, they were going to spend the day moving stones. <laughs> We had a fellow who worked with uh, uh, cement work and that sort of thing. And he had, what do you call him, stone breaker of some kind that Bob went over and, and borrowed it and thought he could break up the stones. And it didn't work. It was just so big. And so it just... We moved it from room to room because the doors were too small to get <laughs> get the darn stone through it, and it, it was it was a good uh, exercise, I guess. <laughs> they had nothing else they had to do at that moment, but uh, the ping pong room was added on. That was put under the kitchen. Under the kitchen, kitchen was must have been kind of cold. I had had never really thought much about that, but uh, it it was. Uh, dug out for that. And so it's just, just big enough uh, for ping pong. You didn't have to chase the ball very far and stuff like that. So I, I found, uh, I, I think that was a, a big part of the history of the house because we didn't spend, we used to have a lot of kids come in, church groups and uh, come in. Now the kids come to see the old house. They don't get to the basement. <laughs> now, why would you have the school children come over? I mean, because of the age of the house or just to, to, to see a dairy barn when you were still doing dairy? Oh, when, when we have uh, kids come, they come like they do to the Norton farm, but we don't have that stuff. We had cows. We had cows. We have, still have heifers. And uh, we have... Uh, Chickens, yes, a few, not many. But uh, otherwise, we really don't, aren't going to have anything. 
But would the would you invite the children to come into the house too? Oh yeah, I, I'd take them through downstairs. I'd like the White House. <laughs> My living quarters at that point were upstairs. I always see it upstairs. Uh, now, and we don't have closets. And back in those days, you had one outfit if you were lucky, and that was it. But I've got clothes all over the place because uh, I'm trying to go from season to season. <laughs> Not that I have anything very, everything's old, but then it fits. Um, in the history that you wrote, you talk about how when Robert was initially building the house, he would only, he hired a carpenter to help him build it, uh -huh. and they would um, only, uh, he would only um, do it as much as, uh, I mean, he had an arrangement, some kind of financial arrangement with the carpenter. Could, could you explain that? Well, no, really, I can't explain it. They only said that he built, um, he always had hired men, and he, he had a lot of, our Swedish neighbors, who later became farm owners themselves, would come here. They wanted to get into a home where English was spoken. And we may not speak very good English, but <laughs> we at least spoke English. And, and uh, they were trying to learn the language. And so quite a few of our neighbors, I can think of, Abrahams and, and Anders and different different ones who came may have worked for him. Uh, they had a a uh, oh what do you call it where you hired people out in Geneva, and these Swedish people would come there, and uh, grandfather would go down and get enough to help. At at one point he uh, he used. Uh, Different things, different, uh, but he, as I say, I imagine there were parts of the year when he didn't need the help, and probably in the winter time. After all, you know, when you think of snowbanks and stuff, and hauling things, and it hit, it took quite a bit of doing. In fact, I marvel at the fact that he built this big house in four years. It, because uh, it is big. It has fourteen rooms, but there are a lot of them, like the den in here, and, and our different times have been used as bedrooms. But we really don't have that much sleeping space. And now that I've taken the only guest room we have, I. <laughs> You just don't want to invite people to stay overnight. <laughs> now, did they build everything all at once, or did, was the house built in stages? Well, I don't know. I have no way of knowing it, at, uh, unless I might be able to be something, be able to figure out something from some of the records we have. Now, I, it's very interesting. We have a list of of things that, what they cost in the 19, 1840s. And like, what, what amazed me was that they could buy uh, pork for four cents a pound. They didn't buy it by the pound. They bought it by the hundred. And the same way with beef and chickens, maybe five chickens for ten dollars or something I mean these I'm I'm just guessing because I, I I have my figures here and I don't really remember exactly but it's it's amazing how little things cost compared with the present day um, when when Robert was working with the carpenter to build the house uh, your history relates how he only would um, have the carpenter do as much work as he could pay him for, mm -hmm. and and then he would. Could could you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's all I know. That that uh, he would pay him and say, uh, 
when I get some more money, I'll call you back. And that's all I've ever heard. And I, a lot of it is, well, you know, you've worked enough, I'm sure, with, with the things. How much he gets at? I'm sorry? I, 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 it's how much you're able to guess about what happened. And I, unfortunately, when I had a gold mine with Grandma Corn, my kids were little and we were busy. And in school activities and church activities, we didn't have time to sit down and say, how was it in this day and age? So it was only things that she let drop once in a while. So when you're relating something like that about the carpenter, that was um, like a family story that uh -huh. uh, you heard from Grandma Corn when she, when she would talk Probably. Uh, Flora knew most of them, but Flora wasn't as good as Grandma about telling them. I remember how my nephews used to be, Bill's older brothers used to be so tickled to come over and see Grandma Corn because she had all these stories she'd tell and things to show them out in the, I think Jack knew about that. They had an oven out in the garage. And on the weekends, I suppose, uh, they uh, would uh, do their baking. Everybody did things by rhyme or reason, <laughs> where nobody does anything that way now. You turn on the wa washing machine and <laughs> everything else and go to bed. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it's, uh, how, how would you use the bake oven? Not too many houses have, you know, even the older houses, if they've been remodeled, they don't have their original bake ovens. Is that still in the wall? Uh, no, I think it's been, I think it became the paint room. It's part of it. It's still in the house, but because it's all brick out there, probably covered with license plates. Because <laughs> <laughs> Bob had quite a collection. Uh -huh. And from what I understand, is that is that part of what had been the carriage shed, the north end of the house? The you what? It, where the bake oven is, is that where the carriage shed is? Yes, uh huh. And we have an outside entrance to the basement that uh, where they kept coal and stuff. Um, Probably wood in in the earlier days. Um, how many fireplaces are there in the house, Lucinda? Well, there's one here, which has the furnace in it now. And they all, I think they all, all have them. The door, so you could shut them up. There's one in there. And there's one in the east room. And one upstairs, so there'd be four. And the one upstairs is in line with this, mm -hmm. with this one? Yes. I've never, I've never personally seen doors like that on them. I think that's very interesting. It just, I mean, I've seen fireplace screens, but I've never seen doors on fireplaces like that. Before. I imagine they had quite a bit of wood. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they probably, I think most of the wood is pine. But I have found that this graining is something that is pretty hard to get off. You read the directions and it says put it on and take it off in 15 minutes. They don't say how many times you do that, but it's probably 50. <laughs> I've done that. I did the, you might be able to see in the, I don't think so, it's probably dusty now, but you, uh, see the 
fireplace, the top of it is down. Oh, and I think the, I did most of the one upstairs. You the mantle? Can you read what's written there? There's a, I see a shadow of something. I can't, what does it say? Welcome. Welcome. Welcome home. I think somebody in the process thought it would be nice. And probably somebody else <laughs> didn't like it. But I think it must have all been done in, at about the same period of time that they covered it up. But it's always a good thing to show the kids when they come. They find things like that interesting. I have a uh, an old cheese box. You know what the cheese box is like. It looks like a hat box. And I have one of those. Uh, Dave had to have something for show and tell when he was second or third grade. And I said, well, we'll go up in the attic and see what we can find. And we found this cheese box, and it was great. He could put his lunch in it, his books, carry it all to school. <laughs> and I don't know if he knew what he was taking <laughs> when he got there. But now I kept it down here, and uh, I have a lot of little things in it. To, when kids come, I show them to them. Kids that, who didn't grow up in Laura Ingalls' time don't remember. <laughs> We have a little cemetery up here on the road where one of the Ingalls children is buried. They were here in Campton Township. Well, Jerry found a record of it. I think he probably told you that they have a... I think the one in Campton, there were two brothers, and I think the one in Campton lived somewhere in the Burlington. And the uh, other one lived up, apparently up the road here somewhere because Grandpa knew the family that had their four graves, four children. But it's on a private home now. I wonder how they get away with that. Uh, they fenced it off and it looks real cute and attractive. But they say they don't let people in. And I think that's unfortunate. Because kids, especially at that age, who are reading Laura Ingalls, uh, it means something to them. I think it's very nice that they're continuing to maintain the grave site. And the, the well, I don't know that that is true. See, the road is changed. When they put the black top in, they changed the road. And there's a kind of a high bank. And some of the workmen who were there kind of wondered if, or, or some, some of the neighbors probably, wondered if the workmen came across these stones and they were in the right of way or something, and they threw them up there. Because they were, they were uh, like this, uh, kind of facing each other. You know, you'd expect to see them in a row, and they weren't. Uh, when we saw them. I don't know how they're fixed now, but uh, when we saw them, they weren't. Of course, all these old cemeteries have pretty much gone the way of livestock or, or people taking the slabs for stepping stones in their garden <laughs> and stuff. And they did take one of those. Um, where where are the corn? Where is the corn family buried? Uh, the corns are all buried in the Burlington Cemetery. And about where is that, Lucinda? Uh, it's um. Well, you know where the schoolhouse is. It's a little bit west of the schoolhouse, across from the. Not not across. I think it's still a little bit west of the, yeah, the house with the cupola. See, the, that was the first white man to come into Campton Township. And Grandfather Corn was the second. I think it, the others were all on their way to the lead mines up <laughs> in... Uh, Around Galena? It, yeah. 
Galena, that territory. Yeah. See, the, the Burlington is one of the really old roads. Of course, it has a lot of quirks and turns in it that they didn't have. But it went uh, from St. Charles to Burlington to Genoa. There's a black top from Genoa. And then it meets up with uh, 20 at Belvedere. And then, of course, the Elgin Road had 20, and they met up there. Then you had the road that the Garfield Road, I suppose, is a, a reflection pretty much of 38. Well, the St. Charles Chicago Road, and it was the configuration of that was sort of paralleled Route 38, but was a little mm -hmm. different. C kind of following Campton Hills Road, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the early maps, uh, it almost kind of amused me, but uh, in looking at the early maps, you see where Anders, not, Campton Hills Road went straight through to where uh, 47. And there's a little chunk, chunk of land in there. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Stewart family. Well, I think the Stewarts own practically everything in sight. <laughs> and I, I think maybe they didn't like that, and they, they closed up the road. I, I don't know if that was the, the story, but it looks like it. That's what I've heard from Martin and, and Jerry that at some point the Stewart family closed that portion of the road from, from Anderson Road over to Route 47. So Campton Hills Road doesn't go through that part anymore. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it always, from the, when I was a kid, it, so it's a long time, uh, it uh, seems like there was a little jog in the road. I'm not sure about that. When we went, see, we would take uh, Anderson Road to Grandma's, and uh, I, I, I don't know why that jog was there. <laughs> now, do you now, get me thinking? Now where did your grandmother live, Lucinda? Well, she lives in the. She lived in the beef house. Oh, she lived in the beef house. Well, she was it, born in the beef. Oh. No, she was born in the old beef house. Uh huh. Not the, uh, that's something else I, I was always going to ask Jerry if he knew anything about it. But the uh, Atlas of 1870, I'm not sure if it's, because one place it says 1873, and another place it says 1872, and another place it says 1874. Well, my grandmother, or my mother, was born in the old house. And the beef house is shown in that atlas. She was born in 1873. And uh, my aunt was born in 1875. And she was still born in the old house. But when you look at the atlas and the, see that picture of the beef house, it, uh, it doesn't ring true because uh, the beef house had, has a, all this uh, old nursery type thing. I think it has a big heart <laughs> out in front, something like that. The heart driveway. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that they didn't have all that. <laughs> but how did they get that picture? And then they have 1870. Two in 1873, and I know it wasn't built till just before 1877, I think. I would guess that. Might have been 1876, because Aunt Mame was born in 1875. But Bob Beast, I don't know if you knew Bob? I'm not sure I've met Bob. I, I've 
met Betty B. Well, Bob, this is Bob now. This is, he's, what, second cousin or something. But Bob Beef was my cousin. And he had a radio shop when they were very popular in uh, St. Charles. And uh, he, uh, his father was my mother's brother and Uncle Rob and uh, my mother and Aunt Mae were all born in the, in what they called the old house. And uh, I don't think you can see it now because I think Aunt Rachel kind of let it go. But there was a, it was kind of a depression out in the front yard. When you mowed the lawn, you could see where our building had stood. And I asked Aunt Jo, Bob's mother, uh, about this because I thought it didn't sound right. And, uh, but <laughs> it's hard to ar argue with printed <laughs> material. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is uh, in the atlases, they are all um, artistic renderings, you know, so uh, maybe they took some poetic license or if the house was already under construction. But I, what I figured was that they did these pictures especially, but putting together a history, they may have, have uh, taken some liberties in, the, uh, in getting it out. I'm going to, we're going to have it out by 73. And it didn't come out then, apparently. But they had to get money to finish it. So I think it probably took for, for, for three or four years to do it because it didn't, didn't seem right any other way. But um, it, for the simple reason, when we were, uh, when we were first married, and I think it was after we moved down here, uh, some fella came around and he wanted to to uh, do a history. And Bob was always a great sucker for everything. But he wanted to deposit it because, you know, he was trying to put this together. And Bob gave him $20. And I think that's what he was asking for everybody, if you wanted to be in it. And uh, if you, probably if you'd had your picture and you'd had more, it would cost more. But if they do it, by subscription like that, uh, they maybe succeed. This fellow didn't. He came back about two years later and said, I couldn't get enough. And he gave Bob his $20 back. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> At least he came out ahead on that. <laughs> but uh, it, that, that's the only way I can explain it, that uh, it was probably a matter of publication. Because that that book turned out to be a a very special thing. Of course, mine isn't. It's it was Grandpa Beast. It's in rags. It's pretty, I made copies of most of the maps, so especially the north part of the town county. But uh, it just had fallen apart. Oh, had he had he uh, Grandpa? Uh, written some kind of history, or well, Grandpa, this was interesting. Was this uh, my my grandfather Beef had this old one, eighteen seventy two. Grandpa couldn't have been too old then, but anyway, probably his father bought it. But anyway, he he had this this old copy, but Grandpa Corn didn't have that. They probably didn't have money to invest in it, but he had a, we, we have what is in pretty good condition, an atlas from 1890, and that kind of takes care of the back towns. You see, like Plato changed direction between those years, between 1870s. And I was just fortunate to, to have the beast one as long as I did because it, it you know how 
old things yet deteriorate, and you can't do much about it. I know Bob, Bob worked at Gale Borden Library for a while, and he said, he asked him about it. There really wasn't much they could do. The, uh, eight, these atlases then, like the 1873 atlas, they also had maps in them? Oh yeah, they had big maps. I've got copies of them. But I've got the original. I haven't the heart to throw all those sheets away. <laughs> Somebody will throw them away someday. Well, <laughs> Pretty soon. <laughs> I, they're very valuable to hang on to. And if you were of a mind to want to include that with the uh, paper documents for the house or whatever. I And I don't know what you've been talking to with the township in that regard, Lucinda, but but please don't you throw it out, because I know... I, I, I go through these things and think I must throw that away. Okay. Maybe somebody will want it, especially when I see all these old letters that I found and found them so interesting. But on the other hand... You can't keep them forever. What kinds of old letters do you have? You, you've talked about the letters from Aunt Addie and then from Myron. A Amy, mm -hmm. is it from the Civil War? I have okay. Civil War letters, about half a dozen of them. I found them in various places in a trunk. Um, and there might be more, I don't know, but I've never run across them. But I've never taken everything out of them. Uh, our attic is, yeah, we never could buy any new furniture because our attic was too full. <laughs> we didn't have any place to put the old ones, and you didn't throw it away. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that you saved all the uh, artifacts and the, the historic treasures that you have. That's a very special thing. Yeah, I thought the family deserved that, after all, Grandpa and Grandma did everything they could for their family, and I, it would break their hearts to see the farm go. It, they, I couldn't believe it. I can't remember their ever celebrating their wedding anniversary. I can't remember the Christmas they celebrated, yes, but they always celebrated October 16th, the day he arrived here. And so you can see how important it was to him. Oh, his birthday was. They got a dish up in the cupboard that they wore a hole in with. Uh, they put what looked like mashed potatoes, but it was cotton in. I can't believe they did it every year because he sure couldn't have fooled people that long. But his birthday was on the 1st of April. <laughs> Stories like that fascinate me. So the family used to put cotton in this bowl? <laughs> well, the, that's the April story. Cotton. They probably did it once. <laughs> it made a family story. <laughs> For, to celebrate April Fool's Day, on his birthday, right? Yeah, on so, his birthday. Yeah. So they must have celebrated it once. I don't know if they ever celebrated it again. But his birthday was on April 1st. I tell you, you have to take an awful lot of history with uh, a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> because... my, my, on April 1st, my dad used to like to um, wake us up saying that when we were little, saying that there was snow outside. So, you know, we, we were going to have to walk to school in snow. Uh -huh. Here it was already spring. And half the time there wasn't any snow. Outside. Where did you grow up? In Chicago, on the northwest side of Chicago. In a little bungalow that my grandfather had built in the 1920s. Mm. So we were living there in the 1950s. My grandmother came as a bride from Scotland. And she, uh, they came, this is what I meant about families coming together. They thought they had a relative living in Virginia. and. I used to tell my dad, well, they knew you were coming. <laughs> so they moved. They never found anybody. So they got out a map. And this, this was in 1849. And they looked at the map, and 
and uh, ha, Dundee, that's a good Scottish town. <laughs> so they, every time they'd go out, uh, uh, they'd see a wagon going by in Chicago, he'd say, uh, she'd say, George, you run out and see if he's from uh, Dundee. And they found somebody from Dundee. They went out and stayed with them for a week or two, and they helped them buy a little farm out there. My grandfather didn't know anything about farming, but and I was like the story they tell about Britain's Hill. Well, Britain's Hill is just this side of Elton. He'd gone to town with a team, and he didn't know much about harnessing teams and stuff. And he said, uh, um, he got stuck. This this is a hill just before you go into Elgin. And he said, uh, he got stuck out there. And a neighbor came along and he said, tough luck, come here, head, and drove on. <laughs> now that's the story they tell. I can't believe that any pioneer ever did that to another one. But it, it made a good story. It was much better than if he'd stopped and helped him. <laughs> I'm boring you with all these other details that have absolutely nothing to do with. But I don't have a paper in front of me. <laughs> if, if I could keep a straight line, I would. <laughs> um, oh, could you tell us about the... Uh the house next door, that right out here? Well, I don't know too much about it. Uh, it was built in 1885, I think the same year the church was. And it uh, was built for a hired man. And the story that I always heard, and I'm sure it probably was true, that there will be very uninteresting and also very dry to you, but it's just as I feel now. I will endeavor to do better next time, so you will please excuse this one. Please write soon, tell me all the news. Let me know when you're to be married. Um, who's your beau, and is he good looking, and anything else you may think up to fill off a good long letter? I remain your cousin. <laughs> but no, that wasn't the one. He tells about, oh, the quarters have plenty of, let's see, business is very good. The poor people who were burned out of house and home are now in very comfortable quarters and have plenty of clothing and food for the present. The stories about the money and clothing sent here from other cities in the country being appropriated for other purposes than what they were intended are not true, for the committees are very careful and say they will show where all the monies and clo clothing has been distributed. They probably have been imposed upon in a few instances. There are long rows of buildings uh, frame, but divided off into rooms for families, and today Many of these families are fair better than they did previous to the fire. People are rebuilding all over the burnt district, but the buildings are mostly wooden shanties. There are some very large brick blocks going up already. They are building a temporary frame for the courthouse this winter. We will soon be in it. A substantial building is to be erected in the spring on old ground for a courthouse. We have not had a fire for two weeks. The weather is pleasant which is a blessing to the people here. I can't find that. Where he tells about. And it's so, so true today.
Yeah, what he says is, when he, t when he was talking about it, and I can't find it where it is, he didn't keep a very straight line <laughs> in his letter writing either. But he says that, that they, uh, they, they'd had all this stuff brought in. But whether it went to the right place or not was questionable. And, uh, and I, get, I think that's what, what everybody feels when you get all this junk mail. What, what is worthy of, of getting it? And I, I, <laughs> I can't help but think history does repeat itself. Mm -hmm. um, Lucinda, I, I brought in a couple of, I had uh, Bob bring in a couple of pictures here for us. Don't, don't be like the man who came to dinner. You didn't even get any dinner. Particularly this one? Uh-huh. Well, that one you see without the pork chop. Yeah, it's a very lovely perspective of the house. And then it also has these other outbuildings uh -huh. in it. And on the uh, far left there, that's the hired hands house. That looks uh -huh. like it was pretty new at the time this photograph was taken. Oh, let's see. This was taken in about 1896, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, that was the... Uh, in 1885. I yeah. believe the same year as the church. Okay. And then it also shows those other barns in, in back, between the yeah. hired hands house and the brick house. Yeah. Now, are, are those barns still standing? No, I think the only one is the one that's higher up. You can see, I think that's, I think that's the main barn. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But it looks about the right distance. Mm -hmm. And you, I think you could see it in that other one too, but it's just a little bit of the roof or, or something. Right. But this other one, just to the right of the hired hands house, I, I don't think no, that structure no. is standing any no, longer. No. No. I, I wouldn't think any of the. Let's see. That may not be the one. I think maybe the, the main barn is back in behind. Mm -hmm. I kind of think these were all expendable. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, a lot of times barns are, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Something else I was curious about is the location of the log cabin. And I was reviewing my notes, and in one reference... It, it talks about it used to sit on the site of the old horse barn. And I was wondering if that was the location. Do, do you remember offhand where, where the log cabin used to stand? Well, I wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, I think uh, Grandfather Corn said it. It was near the horse barn. I suppose, see, when that was, that was built, it, it was the only house. They had, he had spent the first six weeks over on McDonald Road near the spring or went back and forth, I'm sure he, because he had the land. And our deeds, that's something you probably should take a picture of if you're taking. We'll, we'll Did, find those too, yeah. It's a, on top of the, Bob? Well, most of that we want to get, I, I need it more controlled. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll want to also come back and do a controlled, like, tabletop shoot of, of a lot of them too, but the, the, the deeds. Uh, oh, oh. Yeah, okay. it's all right. See what I have? 
I think every so often I just am so thankful I've got somebody who runs and does it <laughs> and knows what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so he, for six weeks, he, when he initially came, he was over by the spring? Well, he used the spring. I'm not sure that he ever lived there. I think as soon as possible. I think it took him probably six weeks to, mm -hmm. to build them. Now this is, is not the original, but it's... Oh, this is a copy? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have the original? In the bank. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we might like to um, photograph that sometime. If, if you'd be willing to pull it out for a special session so we could... I don't know what kind of, of shape it. it's in. I'd have to yeah. have it. So we could there are four or five of them. Four or five deeds? Oh, for the different parcels that were bought? Uh, they were, this is, this is something on the, the, um, the history that I haven't been able to find out. I thought I had all the books on history that I needed. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, see it says on there, um, Whereas Robert Corn of Kane County, Illinois, has deposited in General Land Office. Oh, that isn't important. The provisions, provisions of the Act of Congress of twenty fourth of April, eighteen twenty, entitled "An Act Making Further Provision for the Sale of Public Lands." Now, I haven't been able to find any record of that, and. But I haven't really worked on it. But actually, I think it goes back to the 1787, uh, where uh, they um, the the settler was given a he had he had to purchase or read a purchase. 640 acres is a section. Now, I only know one place where that happened here. But most of these deeds, you'll see this one is what? Oh, here it is, in the, right at the top. The northeast quarter of Section 2 in Township 40, north of Range, even east of the third principal meridian in the district of Sands, subject, subject to sale of Chicago, Illinois, containing 40 acres and 42 hundredths of an acre. Now they were all like that. That is, uh, it was in 40, generally 40 part, 40 acre parcels. And whether that takes. And whose signature is on this one? Oh, Tyler. And who's that? Well, he was the, let's see. By the President John Tyler. Hmm. I can't read the secretary. Signed by the recorder, the 10th of December, 1844. That's a wonderful thing to have, Lucinda. To have those original deeds. Uh, that I think that's absolutely amazing. And that they're signed by the President of the United States at the time. Yeah, well, we have some that are signed by Polk. His administration came in in that period. And uh, it seemed like when Grandfather got the, the land paid for at a dollar and a quarter an acre, he uh, started thinking about building the house. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Now these are just. That's a big difference from today when it's twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars an acre now. I know. That's an incredible rate of inflation going on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but their income. That was why they were able to make so much of it, mm -hmm. what they do. Now this one. Tell me about this picture. Well, this was taken, I think, as nearly as I can figure, around 1885. They still have the buggy. <laughs> it's up in the barn. It went through the snowstorm. Uh, otherwise, I would say probably, uh, I would think the lady of the house and I'm sure that was grandmother, uh, is standing in the doorway. Uh, might have been the two women who were home, who were in the, uh, on the uh, balcony. And uh, I think they might have been the ones to the right of the picture, I think, who probably hired help. And I think... He looks very imposing. <laughs> Cal always said he looked like a Methodist preacher. <laughs> anyway, uh, Grandfather Corn, I think, is the main one in there. And I think the other one over there would have been Myron, Robert Myron. Now, I could be wrong on, on those things. Let's see. Can you see There's nothing you can, in the background. Is can you there? see if you could Just point trees. out? Can, can you point out where? Uh, Great Grandpa Corin is standing. Oh, right there, I think. And where's the little kid? <laughs> but these these two looked young, and and most of the help they had had just recently come from a foreign country, and they hire them for mm -hmm. the the harvesting season or whatever. Right. And we have a, in the attic what we call the, they call the Swede room. And they had these beds kind of lined up. And I'm sure each one had a bed, and I don't know how many were there. But uh, they uh, had little tables. So we've got a lot of rickety little tables around, or have had. Because okay. <laughs> some of them have really gone the way of the wastebasket or junk. Firewood. That much. <laughs> they don't, we don't send anything to the junk. <laughs> uh, I love this collection of photographs. Well, this is, I think this is Aunt Eddie. Never had to do this before, but I think her hair was curly. This is Mary, the two daughters by the first wife. Mm -hmm. And this is Edison. Edison, wait a minute. Yeah, with an A. His, um, he died when he was about 22, I think. And this is Flora. And she died when she was in her early 20s. And this is the one I call Grandpa Corn. Bob's father, and uh, his grandmother. His, his mother or his grand... Robert's mother or grandmother? Oh, this is my Robert's corn mother, or grandmother. Mm -hmm. She had the three grandchildren here. Right. Cal was quite a bit younger than the others. Oh, okay. Um, let me set this over here. So. You can see how rickety some of our frames are. Oh, they're wonderful <laughs> frames. This is, this is a beautiful frame, very appropriate for the period. Um, well, we had 
I think most of those are pictures of an original. Because we had them made for all the, the family. Would it be all right with you if I brought in the piece of cranberry glass that had your grandmother's name in it? Could yeah, in if you want it. Yes, please. Here, hold this up so Dave can kind of see the name, the name in it. Tell us about that piece, Lucinda. Well, this was always my mother's china closet, and she got it when she was a girl and went to the Chicago Exposition, was it? Something like that. What year was that? Uh huh. The Columbian Exposition. The Columbian Exposition. But it, it was the World's Fair. Has her name on it. It says Yeah, Lizzie Beef. 1890. I think it's 93. I think it's, it's a period after it. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how it had five no figures in it. <laughs> right. Um, part of what intrigues me about your personal history is the fact that. You married into the corn family. Your grandmother was a bee, and somewhere in there, you're also related to the Richmonds. Well, the Richmonds, uh, my grandmother was a Richmond. And in fact, I think she was the, the oldest, no, Frank's father was the oldest. And then I think, I think my grandmother was Lucinda Richmond, and she uh, she was just a very quiet, very much like my mother. You wouldn't believe that, would you? When you hear me talking all the time, but uh, they were very gentle, sweet ladies. I'm not so sure about the rest of the family. <laughs> the Nearheads had a lot of get up and go. And the Corns didn't let them push them around either, I don't think. So I guess on all sides, my kids are kind of handicapped. By <laughs> Dave is most like my family, I think. In fact, I said to him once, I think you're like the Richmonds. <laughs> Thanks, boys. Um, how would you characterize Grandpa Corrin? You know, when, when you moved your family into this house, and um, that, no, that was Myron? Myron. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about Myron? Oh, he was, a, he was a wonderful man. He was very quiet, and he... Uh, but just a gentle, sweet, yeah, I know, you shouldn't use sweet in connection with the male, <laughs> but he was a sweet man, and uh, he, he could be stubborn. He, I've got a son just like him, <laughs> not quite a sweep, <laughs> but Dave is very much like his grandfather in many ways. But nobody pushes them around, but uh, they try not to get <laughs> try not to get in trouble. And Grandpa loved his family and didn't like to go very well. I remember Flora used to tell 
how she was so like her father because she would get up and say, I don't have anything I have to do today. I can stay home. <laughs> now I know what she means. <laughs> but I always, well, I always had to go and did go a lot. Mm -hmm. He was sort of a homebody? Well, I, I always stayed home with the kids and I never, never really worked. That's why I went to volunteer at the state hospital. Because you could go there and sit, put your feet up and visit. <laughs> and feel you were doing something. Not thinking of all the dishes you left unwashed. and Beds not made and so forth. And they were so appreciative. And I taught school for long enough to know that such appreciation was not commonly spoken of, but you go to the hospital one day, and they thank you for coming. Um, what, what years were you visiting at the hospital, Lucinda? Mm. I went, started in 18, 19, 18. 1965, and I think I went for 32 or 33 years. I kind of tapered off. I was having trouble then getting around, and I was still driving. I drove up until 98, which was time I quit. Mm -hmm. And I haven't regretted quitting, but I've, I've been fortunate. Do you remember your first car? The what? Do you remember your first car? I don't think I, re we had a reel, I think, but I don't remember it. But I remember the, the Vili we had. Did you ever hear of the Vili? The E-L-I-E. -E. And it had, it was seven passenger. You had the little seats that you pulled up in the back. Of course, that's all I ever got to ride on <laughs> when I was little. But uh, I remember we had that when my sister died. And that was back in the days when you didn't hire a limousine to go to the cemetery. You drove your own car or whatever you had. Of course, you were lucky to have a car <laughs> at that point. But there were seven of us in the family, so. Well, six without Elizabeth. Um, something else I wanted to ask you about was the rocking chair that you have in the other room back here. Mm-hmm. I don't know, do we want to bring that in right now? We can bring it in if you want. May fall apart, but no, it won't fall. It's well made. Could, could you tell us about that? Well, now this is all I know. It's a little bit like some of the sketchy things that Grandma Corn would tell me, but she said this was the only piece of furniture that he had had in the log cabin. And when you see it, you realize that it was homemade. Could you describe it for us? Well, it would be easier if you, if you wanted to show it. Oh, we'll do that too. But I'd yeah. love to hear you talking about what it looks like. Well, it's a rocking chair. Uh, not, a, not the one in the East Room, but just a plain rocking chair. And it has the back cushioned with twine and things that he probably had it was using outside and brought them in when he was making the chair. It's black. I've never done anything to it because uh, the cushion is pretty faded. 
but I didn't want to recover it because I thought it kind of looked old and matched. But so that's about all. So the cushion is original also? I mean, the, the twine is uh, sort of the caning in the seat and then also the back to the chair. But then the, the cushion? The, well, I just would assume that that he put it together somehow. I'm not a, I have a son-in-law who did the cabinet there, and I was impressed with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I I couldn't really comment on it. I remembered it sat in the dining room. Grandpa had a, had a radio in there. With and then he always would come out of his room. His room was his sanctuary, and it was really uh, a good thing because Bob was nine, Sally was seven, and Dave was four. I think he was just had a birthday a few days after Grandma passed away. And... The only one who took liberties going into Grandpa's room was Dave, and he would take Sears Roebuck Catalan. I told you that, didn't I? I, I bet I've repeated myself a hundred times. That's, anyway. That's okay. What would he do with the Sears catalog? Take it into Grandpa and have Grandpa help him make out an order. Of course, it never seemed to get it. <laughs> this is his Christmas. And then one year he did this, I talk about smart things or cute things anyway he, he did we always had um, the mother's club had a, uh, a bar bar barbecue supper at school and I was taking care of the buns or something like that at the barbecue supper and I made holders out of leftovers from feed sacks, <laughs> which I had used to make uh, the things with. Because at that time, we got those pretty feed sacks. Do you, do you remember that? I've seen them, yes. They, all, they were all different patterns. So I was making some of these. And Dave got the idea that <laughs> he, could, he could make some. And I found one he had given to our hired man and one he'd given to Grandpa for Christmas that year. I thought it was cute. Do you still have those? I don't know where it is now. I'd pro it's probably somewhere because we never threw anything away. But I, I, was, I was impressed with his ingenuity. He doesn't have that much now. Imagination, children's imagination, right? Huh. Yeah. Um, I was also very curious about the cheese box. Could we could we pull out the cheese box? Yeah, you can bring the cheese box. Let, let me go get that one. It's good that you would know where all these things are. <laughs> okay. And she's very patient about getting everything. I would say that frame probably wasn't very, very much because see how rough it is. Here, you uh, hold it and you you tell us about the cheese box. Now this is a cheese box. Dave had to do a show and tell bit, and so we went to the attic, and mostly this just we show this when kids come around, because it makes them realize that things are not always what you seem. Now, instead of soccer balls these days, this was, I'm sure, one of the joys of, I think. I don't know if I can hold that very well, but. 
Oh, I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> My left hand works better than the other. The house is full of these. They're a square nail and... Oh, you want that down there? Oh, you can. That's fine. Thank you. Um, and I imagine there were a lot of these. Cowbell. In this country, it's a cowbell. If it were in Switzerland, though, it would have a certain melody. Uh -huh. I don't know if you... That's what they told us when we were there, that, that each farmer had a bell that played a certain melody, and that way he wasn't taking anybody else's sheep or whatever. These are the marbles that were probably leftovers from the and this is what I always think of every housewife had to add to her ironing which we don't do much of these days uh, the napkin rings and you use your napkin I suppose for a week Maybe longer. <laughs> and this, every kid loves this. This is what you put on the stove when you, your mother was ironing, and she had the big iron, you had the little one. I don't know if you're, <laughs> this means anything to all of them. And this is the button hook. I often think today kids don't have, they have television and they have all the, the modern things, but they don't have button hooks. <laughs> and when we, we were kids and company would come, we'd hide the button hook. Kind of a big thing to hide, but, but we did and it was fun. <laughs> This was the kind of fork, I think, that they used at the Wild West things and stuff, Roy Rogers pictures and stuff. But Grandma just swore by this kind of a fork when she was fixing meat and stuff. It was very special. Um, oh, and the button hook, I should have showed you that at the same time was it's a good thing we didn't have a seven footer <laughs> to have his shoe in this box it wouldn't have fit in very well but anyway this is, is I don't know if you can see this how the button hook worked for a one handed person I'm not very handy <laughs> I didn't realize it was so hard. Here. I never had to do it. Lucinda, let's sit oh let's set the box down for a minute and then you could come. Yeah, that down. would be better. I would be coming from the right side. Must have been always easier to go to bed than it was to get up in the morning. <laughs> because you could just pull them off. Even with one hand, I can do that. Now this is a, a uh, what do you call them, a craft sort of thing. But my sister was blind, and she went to uh, the school for the blind at Jacksonville. And I, I think of their little fingers having to uh, sort through the, feeling the size not being able to see it uh, of those beads. But it was remarkable what, what they did. That was back in 1915. Mm -hmm. I should have had a, her slate and stylus, but Sally has it out there. She shows it to her kids every year. And it's it's a, a, like a ruler, 
and it has the alphabet in it. And you, uh, well, she had to go to school to learn the alphabet. I think A was like a, a one dot, but there were six little places. Then you had to, to punch. When I was in college, there were two girls who were blind. They were from DeKalb County. And they, uh, they, they had some trouble with a girl who was reading for them. She'd come in and read for classes. And um, for some reason, somebody, or this girl, and they blamed it onto her, I don't know if she did, but they had had some trouble with her before. But they lost their stylus, and a stylus is, uh, what can I compare it to? It's, it's kind of blunt, but it would go in each one of those holes, and it had a little knob on the top. Uh, and she, uh, and I said, well, we have a stylus. Uh, they had to order it somewhere. And they didn't know how long it would be. And I said, well, I don't know if you can use it. Well, they said they thought they could because I think she had to be, yes, they were younger than Elizabeth would have been, and she had it. But they said there's something about it, like it's like a pencil or a pen. You get used to it, and you can't uh, pass it on very well. But she used it for, for quite a while. So things do come back sometimes. Of course, now that's all. When did when did the uh, they get rid of the the manual type? I'm, I'm not that familiar with how um, blind people were trained to read and so. I never thought of that, but I was thinking of it now. See. This it was a slate and stylus is what they called it, mm -hmm. and and you put your paper in, and it was about the width of of um, what do you call it, uh, legal size paper, and uh, you had little hooks on each side. They could get it, and then they had to feel their way to to find out what they were writing, and she would write home. After all, she was only in third grade, I think, when when she was there last. She went to school different times, but she was not very well. And she'd get sick and have to come home. And uh, so I would guess maybe third grade. She'd been to to the country school before, so she knew colors and she knew grass. Uh, and things of that sort, but uh, couldn't see. What, what was her name, Lucinda? Elizabeth. And uh, she died when she was 14. Now, I was, I was younger, so some of the things I didn't remember and I certainly didn't appreciate what my folks went through. Nobody ever does. Well, I think everybody is comparatively thoughtful about, about people. But we'd, we'd do tricks like sneaking into a room Nobody'd see you, but Elizabeth would always hear you. I think we're going to stop here for today. Cause you don't have to come back again. I I have run out of anything. <laughs> Are you running out of things to talk about? I have more questions to ask you. Um, what I want to ask you about now is 
is how did you meet your husband? How did you meet Bob? When I met him, I went to summer school in Wheaton, and Flora was going there, his sister, and I met him then. And we had a pretty long courtship, but a wonderful one, and a wonderful marriage. He likes sports. I like sports. We went to uh, a lot of games. Hard to imagine it now, but uh, we went to a lot of games and at the stadium. Hockey and that sort of thing. Oh, in Chicago, you uh -huh. would travel all the way into the city uh -huh. to watch hockey games and football games and things. Mm -hmm. Oh, one a year. Mm -hmm. When he could get off milking or something. But Bob was a very special person. Why do you say that? What do you remember as being very special about him? Well, you're asking me, to, everything is special. Uh, we used to go on day trips, like I say, between milkings. Uh, and he'd, uh, he was always looking for license plates. He knew, knew a lot of history. He was very bright. And, uh, but... He didn't know much history about family, except he knew that his grandfather arrived here on October 16th. And they celebrated that, that day for years uh, in 1835. And then I understand now that they put an 1837 up on the sign up here. I don't know who was responsible for it. But one of the fellows from the township said, well, I don't know why they couldn't have looked on the horse part <laughs> because we've got 1835 out there. But that was a very special day for the family to celebrate. And How would they celebrate that? Oh, dinner usually. I guess, because I, I wasn't here for much of the time, but in late years, it was all, all that they did. What other things about Bob made him special that you remember? Well, like I say, he loved sports. I think he played with Wasco teams. And he, after that, he, he was manager for the Berglund team for years. Became Berglund Hummel, I guess. It was a softball team, mm -hmm. locally. But he was very active in. And he was. He was always being asked to MC something. Oh, what kinds of things would he MC? But, oh, Pure Milk Association. <laughs> I remember I going to a pure milk bank once and and the special speaker asked for a glass of milk. This was in the Wasco church. <laughs> and we didn't they didn't have any milk. <laughs> I think after that they instituted this somebody did at least the little cartons of milk that they gave to each guest. But uh, at that time, the speaker made quite a big thing of it, huh? <laughs> he, he thought at least he could get a glass of milk <laughs> in a dairy community. Of course, in late years, there hasn't been a dairy. When our, our dairy moved out, uh, the only other one is uh, down the road on Corn Road within range. So it's a lost ark. The Lentitis farm maybe? No, at 
yeah, it's a... Where, where, um... It's South Silver Glen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mrs. Bailing's farm. Oh, yeah, Mrs. Bailey. Yeah. She has the sheep. Yeah, she has the sheep, but she sold her part of her farm to um, Mr. Lentitis, and he has dairy cattle down there. So I think it's, that's the one you're talking about, mm -hmm. right, Lentitis, I, I can't remember his name. Yeah. But uh, there's, as far as I know, there's still mm -hmm. dairy. And I think one of the daughters married somebody from out in the DeKalb area. And I believe they still have a dairy, but I'm not sure. I don't know why I'm volunteering that information when I don't know. Um, wh what, was, what was your husband like when he was a young man? When you were courting, what was he like? Oh, he had a definite sense of humor. He loved to tell stories, and he, he told them well. And I take the same story and try to tell it, and I always mess it up. <laughs> now, did he go to college also? No. he. Uh, I don't know if he ever got started. He was going to go to... Uh, Illinois Wesleyan, but uh, he, his father was sick and poor health, so he so was he needed. So he took over the farm operation then? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, when, so he was farming here at the corn farm, right? And it was mostly a Yes, well, we lived up where Bob Jr. Is, well, has been living. Now nobody, I don't know if, there's, if there, anybody's moved in there yet or not, but, uh, and I don't know, I imagine eventually they will probably tear the house down. So I'll make a lot of changes. So I can't tell too much. But Bob always lived in in the in the home here. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how old that house is? Pardon? Do you know how old the, the house down on uh, Silver Glen? Well, Frank Richmond said when they remodeled the house when we were married in the 40s, he said that the bricks from this house that had been made here in this house, for this house, and were left, were used in the walls down in that house. So I would just guess around the um, 1860s, but I'm, I'm not sure. But it, it, was, uh, it was quite... Remodeled, it was in very good shape, mm -hmm. and it always has been. Um, what year did you and what year did you and Bob get married? In forty six. Forty six. And how many children did you have, and what are their names? Robert and Sarah and David. This was David. You just met. And um, um, do they have children? Only Bob. Mm -hmm. and, and how many children does Bob have? Ashley. One. My grand grandchild. That's why I had to do volunteer work at the state hospital, because I had all these kids that called me grandma. <laughs> now, what kind of work would you do at the state hospital, and where was that? Oh, nothing much. I visit, and they're, they're just delightful people, but sick. And they're so grateful for anyone coming in to see them. I, I did it for 30-some years, I think, 
I don't think Bob was ever quite resigned to it, but he did get to go with me sometimes when we'd have parties for them. But he, I think, was always afraid something would happen. And I, I never had that thought at all. So was that at the Elgin State Hospital? Mm -hmm. Over on yeah, I started out, it was the Elgin State Hospital. Then it became the Elgin Mental Health Center. But it started, I think, it's the Northern Illinois Asylum for the Insane. I think that was the original name. There were five, I, I remember this from history book, five asylums around the country. I don't know. I think there was one in, uh, not Bloomington. What's the next door to Bloomington? I can't think of the name. No, um, normal Bloomington? Normal. I think there was one there. And there was one down at Ama. And I'd never heard of Ama till I met people who had worked in Ama and came up here to the hospital. Now, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. I, I only visited, just as I used to say, it's the only place I know where you sit and visit, and put your feet up <laughs> and rest. And Bob's theory was I had enough to do at home, and I said, yeah, but I'll still be here. <laughs> And it always was. <laughs> um, now, your husband was involved in a lot of civic matters, too, in the township. Didn't he serve as township supervisor? Yeah, he served, I think it was 27 years. He loved it. That, that uh, was his way of getting away. And he was always active in community affairs and church. And now, when, when the two of you were married, what church did you belong to? I belonged to the Plato Church, mm -hmm. Methodist Church. Then, uh, but Babs, I think I told you about the grandparents uh, built the church down in the woods. And so at heart, he always said he was a Methodist. But it's a Baptist church. And, well, I don't, just don't know what it is now because they've gone through a lot of changes. And. Well, hadn't the, the church that you had right over here on the corn farm, wasn't that a Methodist church? That was a Methodist. Uh -huh. And they had a, a circuit. Um, the parsonage was in, in Plato. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, they had an East Burlington church they call it East Burlington. It's on the end of it, McDonald Road, but west of 47. It isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And this church was taken down, I think, in 1929 or something like that. Mm -hmm. You see what happened? There were so many of these little churches around, but then when cars came in, People could go to their favorite denomination, wherever it was. Um, so you mentioned something about Baptists, though. Did, did uh, was um, your husband always a Methodist then, or did he um, uh, worship with Baptist congregations also? Oh yes, he go. He go. We went to church at the Baptist Church for quite a while. And where was that? In Wasco. Oh, in Wasco. Okay. And I had, had gone there until I just hadn't been able to get around and go without some help. And the boys were busy. Sally was very active. But then she's, she hasn't been home since well, she went, she started teaching in 71, and uh, she's still teaching. Mm -hmm. She hopes she, gets, she can retire in another year. Mm -hmm. um, what, what 
What would you say makes you most proud about your children? A pen. When, when you think about your children and how you raise them, Lucinda, what, what makes you most proud about your children? Oh, I don't really know of anything to be very proud of. I'm just very thankful for the life I've had and the cooperation I've had from so, so many people and the things I've learned from so many people. But uh, I just, just am very thankful for all the help that has been given me. And I think that in a sense was, because I had always thought I loved teaching and I thought I would go back to teaching. Well, and when I moved down here, we had a hired man, there were seven in the family, and a big house, none of which I did very well with, but <laughs> we managed. And Bob was always, he wasn't very much of a housekeeper, but he was very supportive of anything I did. His family was. What do you think was the most challenging thing as a parent growing up? Oh, I don't know, try to instill in them some of the faith that I have. The Christian background that is so important, I think. After all, rearing children is not not a talent that we're all blessed with, and you wonder how many mistakes you've made along the way. But I am very grateful for 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 my kids. Right now, they're helping me, and by just taking care of things. And Sally comes home. You saw, I think you saw her came came home last week, loaded with groceries. She stops and gets the groceries. And comes as often as she can. Um, what was it like for you to raise the kids here on a farm? Well, I don't know, really. We supported them in all their activities. Bob was in the league. Well, Dave was too, but he gave it up after a year or two. Dave is very social, has lots of friends, but it did not include joining things. I guess he didn't like the, the obligations that that can put on people. In fact, I've never been great on joining things. I, uh, I think we're a society that needs, needs people, but sometimes I think we've put just being a member of something is, unless you're going to be a good member, way. It's kind of a waste. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think raising your children on a farm was different from uh, parents who were raising their children in town or in Chicago? Well, I think I, I have a, a lot of sympathy for parents who live in big cities and uh, their only playground is a street. Uh, whereas in here, there are always chores. There was always something they had to do. They may not have liked it, uh, 
but they never rebelled much. I always remember Dave uh, saying that uh, I suppose somebody had asked him what he wanted to do when he grew up, and he said, well, I want to be a farmer. But he said, I don't want as big a farm as my dad. I want to have time to go hunting. <laughs> and so that's kind of, it, it's true, it, you're never done. It's just like being a homemaker, you're never done. You have left so many things undone. And as I look back for the last century, there are so many things I should have done and didn't do. And I think of, I thought of it not uh, I thought of it quite a few years ago. My favorite teacher in eighth grade was a lady from Hampshire. And she was the best, uh, she gave me the best background in English and uh, writing that I could have asked for. And she gave it to her class. And she just passed away about five years ago. And I always regretted that I never, never wrote to her and never did, went out of her way, my way. And it, she wasn't that far away. I could have gotten in touch with her. But I never got around to do it. And I guess that's what my life has been, not getting around to do the things that I should have done, thinking of others. That was one thing about going to the state hospital. I went every week. So I went every week at a certain time. And you know, if you do things at a certain time, you'll, uh, you'll do them. But if you don't do them, and now that I don't drive, I don't, I used to go and visit a lot of people. I miss all of that. Mm -hmm. But I find it all all comes back to you. And the kindness they show you when you get to be so helpless. <laughs> um, what kinds of things would the kids help out with on the farm? Oh, I don't really... There's so many details that, like with a dairy, feeding, cleaning, putting hay down, bailing, all of these chores that we just take for granted, just take time and energy. And I've noticed especially since uh, they gave up the dairy, that especially Bob looks so much more rested and uh, like he doesn't, you know, you knew the cows are waiting for you at five o'clock in the morning. And at five o'clock thereabouts, and maybe supper was waiting for you <laughs> sometime, anytime. Dave and I have had an awful time getting back on a schedule as far as eating is concerned. What were your, what was your father-in-law like, um, Bob's dad? Just a very gentle, kind man. He was not what a friend of mine used to say, a take charge person. He, uh, he loved his home, he loved his family, and he loved the farm. And I know it would have broken his heart and his son's heart if they'd seen a farm being sold. But that's one of the crosses that you have to face. Do you think they would have thought it better that you sold it to the township like you did rather than for development? Oh, I'm sure he would have preferred that. 
but I think he would have preferred to have had boys who were able to carry on, even though this is an area in which farming is just prohibitive. Uh, when you put in a crop and pay all that you have to pay for putting in that crop, and think of that, uh, for a young man. Now, we were more fortunate, our boys were, in having a lot of equipment. A lot of it was pretty old, but it, it uh, filled a need that they had, and they didn't have to start out from scratch like so many people did. But at the same time, when it's a losing proposition, and you're working 16 hours a day, there's just no future in it. Um, how do you think development in this area has impacted the area? Well, I look down over the fields and I think, how much of the the new building that is going on is going to be lasting. I look at these um, malls that have, have sprung up all over. And the first ones that came are now practically extinct. Uh, we just saw the leveling of that uh, West Side Mall in St. Charles. And and that must hurt a lot to see all that good land uh, just stand there deteriorating uh, for the farmer who who worked it for so many years. And it must be very distressing. Would have been very. I'm sure he isn't around now to see it since that came. But I don't don't know why that mall didn't really do better. I, I, as I understand it, I haven't been there since they first opened the Charleston Mall. I understand that isn't doing too well. It's having its ups and downs. They're, uh -huh. Yeah, they're struggling. Of course, our economy's always been that way. But farm economy has been really down for a long time. And uh, as I say, not much future on it. Well, with all the stores, you know, being built, and and with all the people that come into this area and buy new homes and subdivisions, um, how has that changed the community, Lucinda? It is deteriorating as far as the community is concerned. A community doesn't mean much anymore. If you have to go 15 miles to a private school with your kids and you live in the subdivision, uh, you aren't much interested in the fellow who lives next to you. I found that out. See, I worked the cancer drive for years. Uh, on a volunteer basis, and I tried to get workers from subdivisions. And it was murder. Nobody wanted to do it. And I'd say, well, it's a good way to get acquainted with your neighbors. Go and have a cup of coffee with them, or what have you. Most of them said they didn't know their neighbors. And they didn't add it, but they might very well have added, I really don't want to. Now, it was, I, I can't say a thing because I, have, I haven't been a very good neighbor either. But uh, we were here if anybody wanted anything. They came, but that was the old way. And now everybody is so independent. And I, I just think the community spirit has suffered a great loss. And if I, I sound like a small town person, I am. <laughs> I have always maintained there is no great quality in bigness. <laughs> um, 
You must be running out of things to ask. <laughs> oh, I got a whole other page here. <laughs> Let's see what else we got here. Um, when when you were raising your kids, did you have special family parties or family gatherings? Oh yeah, we had. For years, we had a mirrored reunion that averaged around. 50 once a year. Well, I guess at one time it got to 100. But we went for a long time to the, uh, are you familiar with the YW camp? To end the week oh, well, on 25. Yeah, I've not been on the grounds, but I've heard about that. You know, when you drive by, you see the signs or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. I don't know what it's like now because I haven't been there in years, but we did go there for many years. Mm -hmm. I think we started in about 1930 and went had a reunion every year. But then as the, the family grew up and went different ways and don't even know their uh, cousins a few generations removed, and it isn't so much distance, I think it's just new interests. It's the same thing that's happened to the communities in general. And so we stopped having them. Mm -hmm. When did you stop having them? In the, like the 60s or something? No, more like the late 80s or early 90s. Okay. I can't remember when we had the last one. And I gave all the, I was secretary for years. I gave all that information to my nephew. Oh, who was that? Uh, Jack Marriott. He lives in uh, Where does he Bloomington. Bloomington? Oh, downstate? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, there are mirrors everywhere now. His brother just married, his brother's daughter just married a uh, Boston Celtic ball player. <laughs> <laughs> Quite oh, a big okay. affair, according to yeah. Bill, was just here this morning. Yeah. Uh, he's the younger brother. Okay. He lives up there at the farm. But my brother had four, four boys and one girl. Now, you, you had told us a bit about um, your grandmother, Beeb, your grandma Beeb, and but then you also mentioned to me um, the the Kenyan family that apparently were descendants of Joseph Corrin. Who is that? Kenyans. You better spell it for me. K-E-N-Y-O-N. -K -E oh. The Kenyan family. Oh, they're related to the Corns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they lived in this area too, right? Well, it, when Robert Corn came here, of course, there weren't many white people around here now, but uh, the spring before, he came in October, um, Joseph Corn settled in uh, South Elgin, Clintonville by name, if you're familiar with it, but um, and took out a big tract of land. And Joseph had five boys, let's see, I think that's right. He had three, yeah, three that were born. One was an infant. One was two and one was four, which sounds like a something went through. Anyway, they died in 1840. And another son died in, uh, the Civil War. And another son died. I don't know if he had t tuberculosis. I think he was sick for a while, but he died 
in his youth. Mm -hmm. So here he, here's this man who had every hope of having a family pass on his corns, had one daughter. And that's where all the Kenyans from this area come from. Um, and then you've also talked about um, the Norton family. That was did Flora marry a Norton mm -hmm. half sister? So you're you're related to. The, so you there's a connection between the Corn family and your family of of several um, notable farm families in the community, including. Well, isn't that what genealogy is all about? <laughs> I mean, you stop to think, you can go through this uh, cousin that I just, I use the term loosely, <laughs> but she was the, the offspring of my Bob's great, grandmother's first husband. And I just gotten acquainted with her in the last year or two. And she's gotten more stuff about corns. They all came from the, I think Pennsylvania, Virginia area. And uh, she's been gathering all this. It just amazes me. But it, that's genealogy. If you, we all go back to Adam and Eve. <laughs> Maybe not willingly. <laughs> um, do you remember your sister-in-law? Do you remember Flora? Oh, yes. Could you tell me a little about her? Oh, she was a lovely person. Have you met Barbara? She married a Thames, and they live up near Hampshire, but Barbara's just like her mother. Well, not really. She's more outgoing than Flora was. Flora was more like her dad, rather quiet and everything. But uh, Barbara's been teaching for year, years, and that kind of makes people a little bit obnoxious at times. <laughs> They all have a tendency to want to run the show. <laughs> Here I am doing all the talking. And who, who did Flora marry? What was his full name? Do you remember? Dexter Norton. Mm -hmm. And were they married here in the house? Yes. Flora was married here. Jane and Bob were married here. And I'm not sure, I think Cal thought it, but uh, I think Grandfather Corns, Adelia, was married here. The house was built, so I'm probably, it was a show place at that time. They were probably married here. But they moved to Iowa. And so far I've had no luck at all getting in touch with that descendants of that family. With, with Adelia's branch of the family? Well, they, see. What was it you wanted to know? Well, I was, I was intrigued by the fact that um, several couples were married here in the house. What, uh, what room were they married in? Well, Flora was married in there, and Bob and Jane were married in there. Now I'd, oh, Sally was married in there, too. And, and how do you describe that room, Lucinda? Room. It's just the nicest room in the house, but it's not easy to heat, and 
but it's an awfully good place to store all your Christmas presents. We get all the Christmas junk down in there now. <laughs> and it, it's just too cold. Yeah. See, there's no basement under it. And uh, if you don't, and you've got five windows. Just to say nothing of the three doors. Yeah. Um, but visually, how would you describe the room in terms of what makes it such an, an elegant room to hold a wedding in? How, how would you describe that to people? Well, I think because it's so light. You can take a look at it and see, except you maybe get a whiff of cold air. But you can look at it and see why you would think it was. And it was the biggest, probably the biggest room. Because uh, most of our rooms are about, till you got all your equipment in, I thought this was a pretty good sized room. <laughs> and, and Bob, for years, wanted to take out, he was always talking about it, take out the wall in between here and make the dining room and living room one. Well, I'm glad he didn't. It's a much warmer house <laughs> than if, We'd had all that the heat. Also, the dining room has always been kind of special. We had a lot of family dinners and not anymore. <laughs> Time marches on. Mm -hmm. Now the, the room over here, has this primarily been a guest bedroom? You're, you're it, yeah, it was a, yeah, I, I have taken over because stairs are a little out of my realm now. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, and the fact that there's no bathroom in the room did not make it ideal. And Bob was always bringing somebody in and showing them how they could move the stairway and make that a bathroom off the room. But nobody ever agreed with him. So it, it never was done. Okay. But I don't think it, it would have worked very well. The ceilings are so high, and everything is difficult to do. And I guess probably from the historic standpoint, if they want to deal with the historic, it's better that they haven't done too much. See, actually nothing has been changed except, I guess you'd say, the floors and the porch out here. Mm -hmm. They put another layer of flooring over the, like, yes. the thinner oak flooring, I would I guess. think it's an oak flooring. Uh -huh. yeah. um, in, in one of the articles I was reading, it, it talks about a particular room that was Bob Corn's sanctuary. It's what? I think it was an office or something that was... Oh, that's what's the way we got the computer in now. Is, is that back, back that way? Yeah, it, it's got a big bookcase in it. Uh, Grandma Corrin always used it as a kind of a, uh, I guess, a, an offspring of a summer kitchen. She'd put things in there. And I, I can't remember what they had in the bookcases. We've got books. We've got books of everything. I think Bob had almost a complete set of, of uh, the Zane Grays. You know, know Zane Gray? Yes. <laughs> oh, you grew up on Zane Gray. <laughs> I, I always figured that was a really good book to start a kid who didn't want to do a book review. <laughs> Zane Gray was waiting for him. So that was... That was his room. He, uh, then Cal and, and Dorothy moved into up there when we moved out. See, we moved here when uh, Grandma Corn died. She died very suddenly and very young. And... Uh, Dorothy and Cal lived here with Grandpa for a month or so. 
and then uh, then we moved in. But Dorothy used to say that's Cal's wife that Bob every time he came in the house would measure that room to see if his desk would go in there because his his folks had given him this big desk before he was married and he he had it down there in kind of a big room. And in this room, it's in and that's it. There's about so much room on each side. Of course I see the whole the whole office was was taken off the garage, I think. I think that that would be another change. That when uh, and the bathroom. After all they were putting in bathrooms in eighteen fifty. And for a while, I was putting all my junk mail and I got people asking for gifts in the, on Bob's desk. And I've got my desk that I had brought from home in here. And both desks were loaded. <laughs> and they still are. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your mother-in-law like? Um, the what? What was your mother-in-law like? Was that um, uh, Amanda, was it? Uh, Grandpa Corrin's wife? Uh, uh, Augusta. Yeah, Augusta. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I was, used to tell Sally she shouldn't complain. Her name is uh, Sarah Louise. And I said, well, we were debating whether we should call you, what was it? No, I can't even remember it. Hannah, Hannah Augusta. <laughs> and Sally, very seriously in high school, came to me and said something. Did you really mean that, that you were going to call me Hannah Augusta? <laughs> I said, no, I thought I was being kind of funny. <laughs> she, she had worried about it, I guess. <laughs> but, but I thought, see, my mother's name is Hannah Elizabeth. And uh, the Augusta, I never cared very much about, but her name was Augusta Louise. And so I just thought that was, would make an interesting name. There was never any question about the Roberts in our family. In fact, I told Bob there was only one requirement when his first was born. It shouldn't, if it was a girl, it shouldn't be something like Roberta <laughs> or Robert or something. So otherwise, names don't mean very much. There has been a standing tradition in the Corrin family about naming the first, the eldest boy, Robert. Amen. Anyway? Um, could could you talk a little bit about that tradition in the Corrin family uh, about naming their first uh, born Robert, the the boys? Just how well. You know? I guess it's like almost any family, if it's a name they like. Now, Bob's grandfather was Robert Corn. His father was My Robert Myron Corn, and he was Robert Charles Corn. And I don't know exactly who Robert Charles was, his grandfather on his mother's side. And uh, and we used the same name, Robert Charles, so it would be Robert Charles II. But uh, I don't think there was any special tradition about it. We just did what, <laughs> what we agreed on. <laughs> if Bob and I could agree on something, although I will say pretty much Grandma Corn was the 
moving force behind. Well, now we ought to do this, so we ought to do that. And I, I always remember her coming down when we were living on the other place after they'd thrashed or something. She'd go out and she'd take the, the oats and in her hand and look at it and, isn't it beautiful? And, and she, she just loved all growing things. And I remember also she used to say to me, uh, when you go to the chicken house, Cindy, do you knock on the door or say something? And I said, no. And she said, well, you really should, that, that they like to be <laughs> respected <laughs> or something. Anyway, I, I guess I didn't rate me high on that one <laughs> because, but she had such a love for things. And, and you know what these little bandy chickens are? Well, we had a bunch of those when I moved down here. They didn't last very long, but um, they, uh, Decky, Dexter Norton, uh, and I think he had the same love for creatures that, he, that his grandmother did. But I don't think I had it. Not that much, anyway. At least not to knocking on the chicken house door. <laughs> <laughs> no. And usually I was pretty sleepy when I took care of them. <laughs> Didn't spend much time. Are, are there other favorite family stories that you like to tell people about um, Grandpa and Grandma Corrin? Well, Grandma was a, a most interesting person. She loved to sing, and I think she's the one that Sally did a lot of singing at weddings and stuff like that. But uh, I think she got it from Grandma. Sally was seven, I think, when Grandma died. So she probably did, but she just remembers that Grandma was always singing. What kinds of things would she sing, Lucinda? Do you remember? Mostly songs? church songs. Church songs? Of course, that was the day, was, day in the days before. Radio and television and all that stuff. Did she play an instrument? No. Uh -huh. No, I don't. I don't know. Her father was was killed in a train accident. His, uh, I think, the team ran away, and he was thrown out of the wagon uh, down in Wasco a train. They used to have trains through there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that line that, that goes out to DeKalb, it's now the trail, I think. Yeah, where, where did it go? I'm trying, Lily Lake. <laughs> Lily Lake, Virgil. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think where all it went. But it's now a prairie path. It goes through Sycamore. See, Geneva goes to, still goes, doesn't it? Still has trains. What do you think has been some of the biggest challenges that you faced um, being farmers as you raised your family? Well, the markets, <laughs> I suppose, from an economic standpoint, are the big thing now when you stop to think that that we bought the farm, they bought the farm back in 1845 for a dollar and a quarter an acre. And you think now of the thousands of dollars that they get for an acre. It's just impossible to to measure it. I think those are things that the farmers have faced through the years. I think one of the things about history that bothers me is 
that I don't think the kids today have a very good background in history. I, I, I don't know, they tell how they don't seem to know this or that. And I think of, of course, the one thing I think of is World War II. I was teaching during that time and many of my students went into the service. And uh, it, was a, it was a challenging time for all of us. Uh, I think, I never, do you know what a V-mail is? A V-mail? Uh-huh. No, I'm not. I just noticed when I brought this, this book out, I had one in here, I think. If I can find it. I have all the letters. Here's the V-mail. And we had it. I have quite a bunch of them, because every time I went any place, went into study hall or anything, if I had a minute, I would write a letter. And this, it came like in a big sheet, like this. You're having trouble reading it, huh? Can you read it? I doubt it. Let's see. Dear Miss Muirhead, I want to thank you for sending me the Peptimus. That was our school paper. I would like to write a little and tell about where I am, but I can only tell that I'm somewhere in the Southwest Pacific. The country is very beautiful, and we live in primitive style. Although I saw pictures of this place in uh, books and on maps, I never thought I'd be able to see it with my own eyes. The trip over here was very exciting, but it was too long to really enjoy it. When you look at nothing, but water for a few weeks, you get plenty tired of it. I know I did. Clem was transferred to the Marines and in the North Carolina, in North Carolina, and is in North Carolina. Charles is in Chicago in the Navy. That was Daryl Tilton. Did you know him? Oh yes, I had him at school. So you would write your students? Is that? You would write letters to your students? I write letters to the students and have them write to me. And I, I tried to give most of them back to them. But I still have quite a few. And so many of our World War people, you see, they're all in their 70s or early 80s, have left us. And uh, I haven't gotten them all back to them. But they sent them, see, they didn't take as much room. And airplanes weren't not as, they're encouraging people to write. There was no other, no other way to correspond. And so I suppose, I, I think, when I think back of things that, that I did when I was a teacher and it was worthwhile, I think one of the best things I did was to keep me in touch with my former students, because the letters, I have a whole bunch of, of the peptimus in which they, we print. And in the summer, that's one of the joys of farming, you can do this. I, uh, we'd take one day each month and we'd go up to the high school. And I, of course, would edit the letters, you know, you go through a letter and you can't tell her. And, uh, but I think one of the things that the kids liked about it, it wasn't the sort of letter they'd get from everybody else because after all, who writes to an old English teacher <laughs> with, uh, and talks about sending me candy or something? And I might, I had special favorites, I'd send them candy too. But, <laughs> Candy was expensive then to send. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Could you hold that up for the camera so that we can see the letter? I'm getting written. Just, just in the envelope, Lucinda, just hold it up for the camera so that we can see the... That we had that 
snowstorm that, no, 78, 78 or 79. Anyway, the roof went in and didn't do much good for some of the things in the, but then we had to get a new, another tool shed. Still haven't got room for our car. <laughs> <laughs> This picture, Lucinda. But this was the. Is it in there? This is the um, tool shed, and you can see it has a that slanting roof that is. It isn't the same on both sides. Yeah, and salt, it, salt box. It, yeah, on the one side went down. Oh. And, and uh, the buildings look newer and fresher on this one, don't they? I would guess this was taken from the looks of it, because the porch is on, so it would have to have been after 1925. I would guess in the 30s, maybe. I think when they first started coming around to take aerial uh, cards, and you see the old house has the kitchen before they took that off. Yeah. Before. The coons got most of it. Um, the other thing that interests me is comparing this picture with this picture. Yeah, you like the old buildings. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, and some, it looks as though some of the, in, the one photograph is very old, probably from before the turn of the 20th century, like around 1900. This one? The house? 1890. 1890. I, when, the, when this photograph was taken. It, this photograph is older than this other one. Oh, yes, this much older. And I think in the 80s, but I'm not sure. Okay. I, I only kind of had to guess. The 1880s, the, the, you think? I would think in the 1880s. The, no, this one was taken because Addie had it in her diary in 1896. But that one was taken in the 80s, I think. But as far as the outlet of the house, outline of the house, the porch wasn't put on until 1925. Mm -hmm. That is enclosed. That porch is the same. The only thing now that's different in that's very up to date. The railing isn't up there, but we had to put a new roof on the that part. And you know, Bill Johnson. Yeah. He he doesn't take much old houses anyway. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and he uh, he said that every time you put nails in to put a railing on, that you spoil the the roof, and it had leaked before, so that's why we have it, had it done. But uh, otherwise, that hasn't been changed. But the balcony part, where the women are standing up there, yeah. See, these were the two sisters mm -hmm. who didn't marry, and this, I think, his grandmother, my husband's grandmother. Mm -hmm. In the center of the porch, uh -huh. the lower porch. And I, I don't know about these. I imagine they were hired men. Mm -hmm. On the right. Because they always hired a lot. They always had, they had what's called a suite room upstairs. Mm -hmm. And they had little uh, tables and beds, mostly twin-sized beds. Mm -hmm. Now I think this is the fellow who came here when he was 19. Mm -hmm. But I think this is my father-in-law. I'm just guessing because mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The buggy, we know what it is. <laughs> but that was, I think, I think that's still up in the barn. Otherwise, mostly. Now, in this older picture, there are some um, barns in there that are no longer standing. 
or it it it, it looks like that. Oh, the, between, these? Well, the house is certainly still standing, and the hired hand's house is. But some of those barns in the background, like this oh, one no, they, and this one. I don't know anything about that, except that Grandpa told me that most of the outbuildings were built in 1915, except for, you can see, way back. That one. part of the cow barn, and with the old plain roof, uh, that was 1875. Otherwise, the house is the oldest. Okay. I don't know if it identifies anything, but it's pretty hard uh, when you weren't exactly there. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> to visualize. The only thing that we do have some written records and they don't cover enough periods in the area, but they do give you an idea of what goes on. I also have, she, she saved every clipping I think that ever came. And I think uh, a lot of those you could maybe relate. I remember one I looked up, I can't remember what it was now, but on the back of it was something about Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt, got married or was in in England or something on her honeymoon. I don't know what, what it exactly it was, but there was a cue to what period it was, at least. But uh, most of the, the really good clippings were in the 80s. We have a box of candy here. You've been making candy. Could you tell us about these? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just sugar and... <laughs> well, what are the different types of candy you have in here? Well, that's, that's toffee. And you make the toffee and then dip it in chocolate. And creams I make. I only make the kind of creams we like. I make coconut because I like them. <laughs> I don't know if any of the rest of them do. Uh, I make plain creams. The one kind that I don't don't make anymore, I just can't handle it, is um, whipped cream center. It's, it's made with um, egg white. I've forgotten what they call it. But they, put in, but you add that to the basic sugar and water mixture. But uh, as I say, it's, it's difficult to make because it, I mean, it's very soft when you put the egg white substance in there. So it's out of the picture. Turters are probably the most popular. Uh, we just kind of dream those up <laughs> and do what you want. A lot of people use like the uh, craft caramels and just melt them down. I don't know how it works, but normally I'd use everything we have. We don't have much anymore. We used to have lots of milk and could, and we had eggs. We still have. 15 chickens but other than that we don't really have much basic that we used we didn't, never made butter I think they must have at one time because I think there's a churn up in the attic I'm not just sure what period of churn it was it wasn't a, an electric one um, and you make caramels right yeah I make the caramels and you wrap them in wax paper? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you make the caramels from scratch? Yeah. So you don't just use craft caramels and melt them down? No, that's, that's what a lot of people... My daughter is always coming home with some of these trick things that i just never been in the habit of doing, so I don't do it. But um, I don't know that uh, it makes any difference. But they like the caramels anyway. So when I have any 
See, I, I dip what I want to, or make turtles what I want of, and then the rest of the, rest of the batch I just throw in the pan, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you get them too hard, <laughs> lose your teeth. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're pretty popular. And they help fill up a box. <laughs> and then you have um, peppermint bark in there too. Oh yeah, this is this is really simple. You, the biggest thing is finding a simple peppermint stick that you can grind up, and you um, stick the uh, almond bark in the microwave and, and melt that down and and put the peppermint in it, and that's all it is. So when you're eating Fannie Mae's, it's, I'm sure they may probably use the same special ingredients. Uh, I think this is, it's such a messy job of dipping. I think I was using, it might have been a cream, but I don't think so. I'll operate it. I still don't know. It's just a hunk of sweet chocolate that I... You usually let your sweet chocolate get pretty cool. Then you dip. Otherwise, you're going to um, have a... When you take... If you take use it in the refrigerator and take it out and just have this very soft, hot chocolate, it just will kind of go back to that and get your hands all <laughs> messy. And oftentimes I get in a hurry dipping and I dip before it's ready. But it's all edible, so <laughs> that's what they do with it. Okay. I don't know. I'll, oh, my favorite kind is uh, milk chocolate with um, Ice Krispies, and I like to put kind of big hunks of walnuts in them. And that helps fill the box. <laughs> there are lots, lots of tricks you can try. And I like the creams. You can make your batch and you can take part of it and put coconut in it if you like nuts. I think nuts are probably the favorite and less likely to. But I don't ask other people. I just do what we like. <laughs> I do not care very much for all of the, like pineapple and orange and all that stuff that they put in as fillings. I never do that because I don't like them when I get them out of the box. <laughs> and I noticed the box I gave you, I think, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I opened it up. It had been in the freezer all that time, and I blamed that on it. But I, I found out later, I, as I went through it, that it was nougats, a nougat filling or a caramel filling. And apparently there weren't any creams in it. So I guess you gamble when you buy candy in the store. You gamble every time you turn around without meaning to. <laughs> um, now you had a group of ladies over here that you were making candy with? Yeah, I just had a couple. And who were they? What, pardon? Who were they? Who did you have over here? Uh, Ellie Peterson. You know Ellie? No. Ellie's a... Well, she and her husband farmed on the Mungerson farm for years. And she... She's a great person, former school teacher. <laughs> and uh, the other one is a uh, descendant of the Garfields. Betty Stoner, you know her? I, I don't think I've met her. Well, she was a Harley. If you, I, I'm not sure about the ancestry because I never worked on I have enough ancestry of my own to try to figure out what happened, but um, 
the Garfields were a big family, and I think her her grandmother was a Garfield. I'm not sure, but she had been wanting to come make candy, so I said, "Well, you can come." Does she live in Chicago? She lives in Arlington Heights, I think. Now, it I might think be Palatine. Okay. It's one, one of the... I, I think maybe I have met her. But Candy um, Harley. Um, oh, yes. She's, she's a sister-in-law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've met Betty then. Yeah. She's a nice lady. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Real sweet. Um, no, it was, it was kind of a fun thing. And it was, the nice thing was that they did all the dishes. <laughs> One of the hard parts about candy making, almost anything you do in the kitchen, dirty dishes. Kids are, of course, the <laughs> best source, but uh, there's always dishes. And you think you've got them all cleaned up, and you go out and find a whole batch more. <laughs> yep. One of the joys of homemaking. Um, uh, something we wanted to talk to you about today, Lucinda, was what it was what it was like for you growing up in the area, and then being on the farm here. Um, I grew up on a farm. And where was that? Well, uh, it's a, on Muirhead Road, about six miles from here. Muirhead Road is parallel to Crawford Road and to Corn Road. Mm -hmm. And and who were your mother and father? John Muirhead married Elizabeth Beeth. The Muirheads came from Scotland originally. And uh, well, the beast came from Scotland, too. And my grandmother was Richmond. So they were all pretty much Campton or Plato Township people. And what did your father do for a living? Farmed. What kinds of things did he farm, Lucinda? Well, when I was at home, it was mostly dairying. Then they turned to beef. Mm -hmm. uh, and what were their, what was your father's full name? John. Uh-huh. He, oh. didn't, he didn't have a middle name. Okay. I don't think he did. And I didn't have a middle name until okay. I got married. I could use M. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, it meant something. <laughs> um, and where did you go to school? Well, I went, went to four years to a country school. And then we... My older brother was in the new high school at Plato Center, Plato Township High School. And so when it rained, there were no buses. Uh, when it rained, they'd come after us with a buggy or yeah, horses or something. And it made it easier to have us all in one school. So when I was in fifth grade, I went into a two-room school at Plato. And I went to Plato High School and Wheaton College and Northwestern University. And, and what did you study at Wheaton College and Northwestern? Well, I majored in history in Wheaton College. And then I got a job during the Depression in Plato teaching, and so I... Uh, And, I, and the job was in English. 
So when I went to Northwestern, I took English and got my MA in English. Did you have a specialty of study or some, some favorite things in English? Well, not, not really. It was just a BA um, and an MA. Uh, I can't remember which school it was in now. Do you have some favorite authors? Pardon? Do you have some favorite authors or poets? Oh, I always like to read. My, uh, I always found it a good excuse to get out of chores that I didn't like doing. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I have more stories than anything else, I guess. But we used to watch cows on the road. And I know you're too young to know what it meant to watch cows, but the high, the especially the country roads had a lot of grass growing, so this nice green grass in the spring was just like giving cows candy. They loved loved to go out, so we'd take take the cows out and let them uh, graze, like for an hour or two, or two hours. And I always got to go at the end of the line because uh, I had a book to read. And sometimes it was even a history book. I remember reading my eighth, my brother's eighth grade history book when I was like in seventh, sixth, or fifth or sixth. No, I must have been younger than that. But nobody could understand why I wanted to read the hist history books. But uh, anyway. Uh, this one day, I don't know if it happened more than once, but it made a good story once, was um, I was at the end of the line, which is about a mile from home, and uh, I was interested in what I was doing, and the cows weren't bothering me, and pretty soon the mailman came and he said, Cindy, they're putting the they put the cows in quite a while ago, and you're supposed to come home. <laughs> the, the other kid on the other end had, when the cows were done eating or when the time was up, I, I suppose some of the men helped him. I don't know. I don't know how it worked there because I was never on the other end. But uh, I always thought that was kind of funny. They had to come and tell me to, to come home for dinner. Um, do you remember your first day of school? Well, I remember my first teacher. And I ran into her after I was married. And she was living in a subdivision down on Corn Road. At that time, she was teaching in Chicago. But the teachers got out of, now that they went to high school, at, at the end of eighth grade, they would go to DeKalb, maybe for a summer session, maybe for, then in later years, it was two years. And then eventually, of course, they had to have a, a bachelor's. But DeKalb, that's northern now, was, a very popular uh, teacher's school. In fact, it was called when I, I think when I was in college, we used to play to help teachers. I don't know if this is very. It, when, when you were still in the, it was a one room schoolhouse initially that you mm -hmm. were in, what was that like? Oh, it was great. There were about 10 of us. And if you didn't like what you were studying, you could always listen to what the other guys were doing in the upper grades. I guess that one of the things I remember most about that was uh, there was a the farmhouse right next to the school. And um, they uh, we had to get water from there. You've been in... Uh, uh, 
on Dean Street. Oh, Shoals School? Yeah, mm -hmm. Shoals. I used to, you wouldn't believe it, I used to do uh, volunteer work there. But um, we uh, would go over and get this water pail filled. But since I was only in fourth grade, there were a lot of older kids, and they were the ones who were chosen. But they could take one little kid along with them. And I was just looking forward to the time when I would be big enough <laughs> to care, take the, the, uh, uh, the pail and do the thing. And I'm not sure how, that I realized how soon that time would come. <laughs> when you're big enough to do almost anything and can't do anything. <laughs> Life moves on. Yeah. Um, what did you used to do in the afternoons when school was over, when you would go home? Did you have chores or? Well, we are supposed to be helping my mother, but my mother used to say, that if my father had had um, all girls instead of a couple of boys, that uh, he would have them working outside. <laughs> and that was true. And we, we preferred to work outside because it was a little different. It depended on the season of the year. Sometimes we... Uh, Oh, and uh, I remember in one of the things I hated was we had to pick up corn after they had husked and um, throw it on the wagon, and then we'd start throwing the corn at each other. And you know how kids are. You have to find entertainment wherever you are, and we did. What other kinds of things would you do in? Let's say in the winter time, this time of year, when you would come home from school and just come home to read or do schoolwork? Or well, I'd read when they'd let me. My favorite thing always was, I don't think any of you would, either of you would ever have had anything to do with the Horatio Elger series. Always but, one of my mother's favorites. She talks about that. <laughs> well, when I was a, a kid, uh, my father, uh, my brother was seven years older than I was, so he had all these boys' books, and I loved Horatio Alger. And the favorite thing was she's reading Tom the Bootblack again, <laughs> and I'd reread re -read the stories. Uh, so that that sort of thing was always entertainment, and we had a big family. So, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have had two sisters and two brothers. In the spring, did you have special things to do after school or? Well, I, I can't remember that, that we did much with the gardening. I can remember in the summer we went barefoot, and when we had to go on the, in, out to the oats field, and I can't even remember what kind of a weed it was, but it, it was yellow, like, like mustard or something like that, and we had to pull that out. Now, that's just one of the jobs I hated. But as I say, I, I was all... If I could, I was always reading. Libraries were pretty far from us, and uh, if you know how much libraries mean to kids these days, it's something that I felt. I think I had to wait till I was working on my master's at Northwestern. I had made a list of all the, the classics that I hadn't read, and, and I spent the whole year before I t 
took my finals, uh, reading up on classics. I was teaching at the same time. And what were some of those books, if you can remember just a few titles? Oh, I love Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, all the things that went with it. I loved Shakespeare, but I can't say that I read too much of it on my own before I got in advanced studies. And I have always liked nonfiction. I much prefer that to, well, especially the type of so-called literature that you get these days. I, I just prefer the, the old-fashioned type of thing. And my son always says, Baba says, Mom, you just like things with a sick, happy ending. <laughs> That's probably true. Did you, did you ever read any of the Greek classics, Ulysses, or...? Yeah, but don't ask me anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a most interesting teacher in Wheaton. She was, she must have been in her 70s, although I'm not, not a very good judge of age, but um, she would quote from some of these Shakespeare, different ones. And she'd pick out things that were, and you know you can do it with Shakespeare. There's almost anything to <laughs> prove a point. And then she'd sniff. <laughs> and if somebody, and we always had chapel, and if the speaker would say something that she particularly approved of, she'd sniff. <laughs> and it, it was a real big joke among the she was, she was a delightful person. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any hobbies when you were growing up? Or uh, other, other things you liked to do, like sewing or collecting things? Or No, I don't, I don't think I, I didn't do. I had home ec in high school. No, in grade school. No, 4-H. <laughs> I'm trying to think where I did have it and didn't do very much with it. The only thing I told my mother, I had learned how to rip. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You'd learn how to rip? Yeah. You, you know, you sew something on the machine and you uh, pull it part way and then it'll go, go on the other side. Uh, and it helps very much if, if you know how to rip. <laughs> I mean... You can take it out, whereas most of the things I needed taking out, they weren't doing too well. And I can't say that I cared too much about sewing or, or anything like that. I'd much rather read. But um, as I grew older, especially when I was teaching, I used to, you can't believe I did it, but I used to get down on the floor with my patterns and cut out dresses and stuff. And I, I enjoyed that. I did it. I did it uh, with my kids, for my kids. You, for, would, you would sew things for the children? Yeah. Uh -huh. that, uh, there was a period, I think it was in the 50s, maybe, 60s, when our feed for the chickens came in flowered sacks you don't remember that? Mm -hmm. You do? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's <laughs> something. Anyway, uh, I used to make Sally dresses. At that time, we made dresses. And I remember saying to my sister-in-law, who had an older uh, child, oh, what cute dresses Liz wearing. And she said, yeah, but she said, I don't know why I'm making it. She'll be wearing your father's shirt. Next, do you remember when Star got to be that the girls would wear these great big shirts? And, 
and uh, I don't I don't think Liz ever did it, but these dresses that uh, Catherine made were really cute. I can't say anything I did was especially. I rather knit. I learned to knit during World War II, and I still like to, but I I don't do it. I don't do much of anything now. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things would you knit? I mean, what got you started knitting during World War II? Well, I would say during the war I thought it was real smart because nobody else would do it. And I had had a pattern and I knitted gloves for the guys in the, in the service. And I think they must have <laughs> just hated them. I don't know. I don't know what it was like in the, in the war. Was that before you were married, Lucinda? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So you would knit gloves for the servicemen? And the well, that was one of the things. None of the, the older, better knitters really cared much about trying anything, and I would try things. And they're, they're nice and little, easy to hold. And even at that time, maybe I was thinking more of myself. And I got done faster. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I did like knitting. Mm -hmm. Crocheting, I was never very good at. I tried to teach my daughter to, to crochet. And it was like the blind leading the blind. But uh, I also tried to teach her knitting. Well, she ended up liking to crochet. She crocheted that thing for me. She's still teaching, so she doesn't have time to do much now. But um, she made me an afghan, a few things. And she's made quite a few baby things, and she's always bringing me yarn. And I, in the last few years, I've, I've done, oh, you know, these ski sweaters with different colors, and I made one there for my granddaughter, and I never saw her wear it, so I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> I was impressed, but I guess she didn't. I, I think she thought it was too warm. Okay. Okay. Did you ever play a musical instrument? Yeah, no. no. I played the piano for my own amazement. <laughs> to quote, what was it, Jane Ace. <laughs> And uh, other than that, I just had no special music I like to sing. Now I can't do anything as far as that goes. But uh, I can't think that I had any special talents. Mm -hmm. well, the only thing I did do was a lot of book reviews. You would write book reviews? No. I would get programs with book reviews of books, books that I liked, or, or books that they liked. You would get together with a group of other ladies or people? And, and no, this was like for ladies' aid, women's clubs, and stuff like that, where they wanted someone. I started doing it in connection, I guess, with devotions, mostly. And I had quite a few people whom I regularly visited, but that's, that's about the only special thing I did. All very boring. <laughs> Well, no, you would, you would read a book and then go to uh, get together with the group and talk to them about the book? Well, we did that in a book club where we each did. So we took a, took a different book. Now that, we did True Women's Club, and that was a group of ladies. But this other, you had them at your mercy. <laughs> you just talked about the book, what you liked about it, and more or less a critique of it. Um, 
Did you have any pets when you were growing up? Oh, we always had dogs. And they were always getting killed on the road. And I can remember when we'd bring the dog in the house and my dad did not approve of our having dogs in the house. So we kind of sneaked them in and out. But other than that, we had lots of, I think we always had a great affection for like little calves and, and cats. But I, I never liked cats very well. I liked the dogs better. Um, what kinds of special things would your family do on weekends or in the evenings? Well, in case you don't know, a weekend is pretty much like any other day as far as a dairy is concerned. They don't know it's Sunday, so... You have to do all these things that need to be done. And I would say mostly we, uh, we went to visit relatives. My grandmother lived 10 miles away. We used to go there. Uh, and I guess you would say some of the happiest times we spent were maybe in her attic or in the backyard, playing ball with the, the other cousins, but because most of them came once in a while. Now, which grandmother was that? Well, I had two Muirhead cousins. I had two Beats cousins. And uh, the suitors were... Uh, on my Uncle Will Beast's wife's family, and they lived lived there, so they were always there. So there was always a pretty good crowd. We could have a ball game or something. So when all the cousins got together, like there were twenty of you or something. Yeah, probably more like. Well, but then Uncle Will was always a kid with us. He would always play with us. One of my favorite people. And what do you remember about him, Lucinda? And maybe just because he liked to, he had a, de a definite sense of humor. He said that. Uh, I remember he came to see me. I had pneumonia. He was sick, and he said, well, she isn't talking so much today anyway. <laughs> I, I felt like saying something, but he, cause he thought I didn't know enough to <laughs> say anything. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Uncle Will was one of my favorites. Was he a beef or a mirror? He was a beef. But Uncle Will Muirhead was... Uncle Will Muirhead was the one that told me all the family history. I wrote the Muirhead history when I was, well, before I was married. And uh, I got a lot of the information from Uncle Will Muirhead, and he, he would tell, he told the best stories. And he would tell all these stories and then he'd say, uh, I'd ask him about something. And he'd say, where did you hear that? And I'd say, well, Aunt Lou told me. And he said, oh, Lou's crazy. She doesn't know what, remember that. I think Aunt Lou was a little younger than he was. But I would go back and forth between the two of them. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have the source of material that I had here. Of course, I didn't have anybody here to tell me either. I worked on when I worked on Canton history. Uh, the, um, it was a. I, I 
just catch a little bit of it here, and I'd remember Mother'd talk about when she was a girl. She was born on Beef Road and lived over in that area. And she would talk, mention names of people. And I, I just wish that I'd listened to her more. But uh, I guess the only reason I started working on the Hampton history was because I had found a lot of material that sort of pertained to the township. One of the, I don't know if you, have you read the Campton history? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most delightful things in the Campton history is a story that was, was written by, it was a, um, local story written by, can't think of his name. He was a Garfield. Franklin Green, perhaps? Hmm? Franklin Green Garfield? No. No, this was back in those days. I had the clipping of, that Abby had kept, and uh, so I put it in there. But it, it told about a Campton Hound, Township meeting that was held in Lakes Barn. And Lakes Barn is over on the intersection of the Burlington and Silver Glen. I suppose it was a log cabin. But it told about the election in 1844, the first presidential election in the township. And uh, this was written in 1888, I think, 44 years later. And it mentioned that everybody in that first election who voted, um, and there were seven of them, I don't know if I can recall all of them. Robert Corn was one. Uh, the Garfield who wrote the article was another, the um, lakes, another, and uh, I can't think about it right now. But these seven people voted again in uh, 88, and I just loved the way they write. He wrote, he said, uh, In those days, men were not afraid to say what they thought and were very, there was no stuffing the ballot box. I don't think he used that word, but none of that. It was straight from the shoulder and the books were open all day long and you come in, could come in and see who voted and how they voted. And then in, in the article, he tells how Robert Corn voted, I think, Clay was one of the thing. I can't remember the three of them. Clay, who signed Polk, and the three contestants. I can't remember who the third one was. But anyway, it it told who Robert Corn voted for. Men were not ashamed, <laughs> and I thought it was kind of delightful. <laughs> Uh, this, um, and I wasn't so sure about that there was no stuffing of the belt. <laughs> it's a little bit like the, I was telling Dave here about the, uh, the story that this uh, relative from uh, Chicago who worked for the fire department wrote about uh, the uh, Chicago fire. And he told how generous the whole world had been when the fire broke out. And they said all this thing. And then he said, ended something to the effect that you just wonder how much of it goes to the right source. And I think that's so true of today. We're still doing the same thing. Um, did 
Did your ch uh, family belong to a particular church congregation? Mostly? Methodist. Methodist? Uh -huh. and, and where did they go to church? In Plato? In Plato. And what was the name of the church? Plato Methodist Church, but now that has gone in with an Elgin group. I don't think there are many Plato people left in it. It's the Cornerstone Church. They just built a new church on Russell Road in Plato. But I would say it's primarily Elgin people. Mm -hmm. um, did your family take vacations when you were growing up? <laughs> if there was between milkings. <laughs> I would uh, imagine it was very difficult to get away from a dairy farm. It is. Yeah. Well, we had, Bob and I had a wonderful trip to Europe, but we had a friend who had just quit farming, and we got we got away for three weeks, and it, it was great. But uh, and then when the boys got older, we could get away a little better. But he was still pretty active. What year did you and your husband take a trip to Europe? 66. Uh-huh. That was 1966. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Do you remember your first car? First what? Your first automobile. I think it was a Rio, R-E-O, I'm not sure, it may not have been. The one I remember best, I was about, well, I was nine, but when my sister died, you know, back in those days, you used what car you had if you had one, and uh, we had a Vili. V e l i e, and they uh, it had it was seven passenger, had two little seats in the middle, and I remember uh, for the funeral we had that. So I, I Elizabeth died in nineteen nineteen. So and you were telling um. Dave and I, some instances of traveling before you had automobiles, or maybe you had one, but alternate modes of transportation that were like older. Well, uh, the best transportation we had, I guess, was with a buggy, and it was usually my mother driving. She never drove a car, but she drove a horse, and uh, we would get to go, like I say, between milkings, but in thrashing time, we, the men always got two meals where they went. They'd get the dinner and then they'd have supper too. So that kind of gave us, and I, one of the things I remember uh, most is the uh, Automobile races in, in uh, Elton. They had, you know, where Larkin High School is, mm -hmm. and uh, they. I think they start. I don't know which way they started, but they went down uh, McLean Boulevard to Highland Avenue. Came west on Highland Avenue to. I don't remember the road that goes across to Edina, but they came into Edina, if you know where Edina is, and um, then took 20 goes through Edina, the oldest road in the area. And uh, 
we took 20 in the, back to Larkin. I think it was something like five miles. That was in 1923. And I remember my mother taking us kids to the, um, when the, the family was away, uh, the older ones were away thrashing, but we went to the Edina Schoolhouse, not the Edina Schoolhouse, the East Edina Schoolhouse, uh, where it's still Nestler Road, you know, where Nestler Road comes into 20. And at the end of Nestler Road, you may have been watching, if you've been in this area long, uh, there's a, they've been working on, I think a church owns part of that land right in the corner. Well, that used to be the East Edina Schoolhouse, and it had this out there privy, <laughs> all, all the things that, that one needed. We took our picnic basket and we watched the cars practice. See, they were practicing on the route. So, so that was a big thing in our. And there were, always, there were always special things. Fourth of July and... How did you celebrate the Fourth of July? Pardon? How would you celebrate the Fourth of July? Oh, with firecrackers, <laughs> if we could afford them. We always had somebody always had something, mm -hmm. and we always had big picnics. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to travel by buggy in the winter time? Well, mostly we used the sleigh if there was snow. Otherwise, I mean, I was just recalling one Christmas, the roads weren't very good for traveling because all the country roads were pretty bad. And uh, there was enough snow, so the family went to Grandma's for Christmas, as we always did. Uh, with the, the bobsled, but uh, we also had a, but I don't even remember riding in it, we had a, a, four, a two passenger, not four passenger, I should say, buggy. It wasn't a rumble seat, but it had the two seats in it. And somebody borrowed it for a, uh, I think it was a Farm Bureau parade on the 4th of July, and we never got it back. So that's one of the things. That... Um, do you remember when electricity first came to the oh, yeah. area? What was that like for you? Well, before that, folks had had a, uh, I think it was a Delco plant or something like that. And it, it's like the same principle that they have in hospitals and emergencies. And we had that, but I remember my aunt who didn't have it, said she thought that's why we had such poor eyesight in our family, <laughs> because <laughs> they, the power would go down. You had to have a, an engine running it, and when the power would go down, then your lights would get dim. So, even though it was better than the than the uh, lamp light, it it still wasn't very good. But I think that's when we first. Did. You want to tell us something about the, the family history, how the 
Oh, your the family first came to Kane County. Well, grandfather Corn came here when he was nineteen years old from Virginia then. But now it's part of West Virginia. Greenbrier County, if you know where it is, it's on the extreme edge of uh, West Virginia on that. And Virginia's about six miles away from where the split was. He had brothers who had come, I think, to uh, Niles, Michigan. I'm not sure it, it's possible that their mother had lived in that area. There were lots of relatives. I'm still finding them. But uh, they come. He came in a covered wagon with a quilt or something of the kind that his mother had woven. I, I don't know how much of the process they did in those days, but that's the sort of thing that she uh, she sent her son, and he was the youngest in the family of, I'm not sure, eight or ten, I've never stopped to count them. Uh, one had come earlier, his uh, brother Joseph came to uh, Clintonville, now South Elgin, in the spring of 1835. Grandfather Corrin came, this is Robert, came in October, arrived here October 16th. I often thought, what courage to come to this part of the country at this time of year, which is delightful as far as looking at it, but it's pretty cold. Anyway, he brought with him Joseph's wife, to uh, the, uh, or not Joseph's wife, Joseph's fiance from Virginia. And uh, a week later, he took her and his brother into Chicago where they were married. They had a family of six, I think there were six boys uh, and one girl. And of that family, only the girl survived. Three of them died. Uh, one was an infant, one was two, and one was four. And later on, the uh, um, one died in the Civil War, and the other died, I'm not sure, but apparently he had suffered from ill health. And the, six, uh, the girl married, and they have all kinds of descendants. <laughs> but they're all, of course, not corns. I mean, that the name died with his boys. Mm -hmm. what, what was her name? What? Lucinda, what was her name? Do you remember? My name? Um, the, the girl. Oh, the Cornelia. Son. What was it again? But Cornelia. Mm -hmm. But she was uh, Joseph's wife. Uh, uh, Robert Corn, as I say, was 19 when he came. And he didn't marry until... 1840, I think it was, and uh, he married a Mariah Eddy, and uh, her family lived to the south, but in this area, and uh, they, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you want to hurry through this, or if you want to take time on it, or what. But they had 
I talk, we talk about Aunt Addie, and she uh, was the oldest of the family. And apparently she wrote an awful lot of letters, because we had a lot of letters with very little education. Um, Adelia was the second daughter. Hope I can remember them. I should have brought my book along, just in case. But um, anyway, they had a boy, Edison, and they had two more daughters, and Mary and Addie never married. Adelia married a railroad man, and they later moved to Iowa in that area. We've lost track of that family, and I've never been able to. There were only two boys descended from that particular family, but I've never gotten any more from them. Anyway, as time went on, uh, Mariah didn't have very good health. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, it's M-A-R-I-E. And they went, anyway, they went, uh, they had this family, and well, we have deeds to the farm that were dated in 1804 and 1845, 44 and 45. And they were, um, that was when they put the deeds on sale and you went into Chicago and I got them. We have those in the bank. We have a copy of it here if you want to see it. And in, uh, she had poor health. And some of her letters tell of the family and apparently uh, the son. Edison had very poor health, and he died just after she did. I think she died about 1870, and uh, I think he died the next year. Anyway, after her death, he went into, uh, he married Barbara Thompson. She was also from Greenbrier County, but she was born after Grandpa Corn left there. And so she uh, had been a school teacher. Uh, the little schoolhouse down on, uh, it has been restored three or four times and some vandalism always occurred. But it's, it's on the Burlington and Wasco Road, if you know what I mean. And she taught there for a time. Uh, everybody was related to everybody else. And I'm not sure how the Thompsons related to the Tuckers. But the Tuckers owned this farm, down, part of which has been farmed by our family lately. But it's, um, they had, I think, I'm not sure if they came, I don't think they came from Greenbrier County, but a lot of neighbors did. They came from the same particular area. Anyway, um, she went, uh, she married Grandpa Corn, Grandfather Corn, and when she, um, he came home after having married her, uh, some of the Daughter said, well, Pa, why didn't you tell us you were going to get married? Well, he said, I didn't tell you the first time, so I don't see why I should <laughs> bother you with it the second time. <laughs> well, from that marriage, the important one, as far as we're concerned, was Grandpa Corn. He was born in 1875. Just how far-reaching, I don't know if you want all this, but I have learned quite a bit just 
from various people. And this happened about a year ago. A friend of my brother's brought a lady that he met, she met in the cemetery in Plato Center. And she, I, I was impressed because she had um, heard about her family from the uh, internet. So that gave me a new insight into something that <laughs> you could get information from. Anyway, she came here and she wanted to know if I knew anything about her particular family. Well, all I knew was that Grandma Corn, my mother-in-law, uh, and she, she had to have gotten it from her mother-in-law previously, but she said when they had the barn raising for the big cow barn, that she uh, uh, carried Myron. They called it, his name was Robert. But Robert Myron, and she, Grandma always said, she uh, she had Myron in her arms when they had the barn raising in 1875, and that was the year grandfather, Grandpa Corn was born, and my husband is the oldest of that particular uh, family. Now, I, I don't know where you want to go from there, but <laughs> there's a lot of things you can tell. Maybe I've mm -hmm. sidetracked it quite a bit. But. No, you've been, you've been on the right track here. Um, I've, I've read through the history that you wrote about the family. Oh, well, it's, I, I bored nice. you with a lot of details. Oh, no, no, we need to have all this detail on um, the videotape so that when we show other people that they can hear the story for themselves in your words, that's part of what we're working on. Oh my. So it will be a wonderful um, production when we're done with it, Lucinda, and you'll get to see it. I don't know if I can stand that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. You had, in, in the history that you wrote, you talked about how um, uh, the family, Joseph and uh, uh, Robert, the original Robert Corrin Sr., had, had been involved in um, moving the Indians out of the territory? Uh, that's all I know about it. I, I, all I had in there. Uh, it was, uh, as I say, Addie wrote letters. She kept clippings. Most of her clippings, uh, the clippings that she had kept of articles, were in the, uh, um, oh dear, finding words. I can't even remember my own name half the time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she, uh, in this uh, clipping from one of the local papers, I don't know, Elgin Advocate might have been one of them, because it seemed like quite a few were from that particular period in the 80s. I'm not sure about it. But anyway, uh, it said that they helped move the Indians across, across the river to a home in somewhere in Iowa, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure where. Mm -hmm. I think at that particular time, it was 1836 that took place. Uh, I didn't tell you I guess this was something I found out later, so it might not have been in the original history. You know, it's amazing the things you pick up from time to time. And after all, I don't know if you noticed the date on it, but it was 18, 1972 that I wrote the history. But um, James, who was the oldest brother of uh, Robert and Joseph, and he uh, came here about a month after uh, my ancestor did, that's the corn ancestor, and he uh, 
had this farm. She mentioned the Golden Saints. It's rather interesting that the, this picture book <laughs> had Margaret. She's a, the daughter of the Golden Saints who now own the farm. And her father used to laugh about it and say that Dave should be farming both <laughs> the both farms because uh, the corn name was on the uh, original. But that was that was inherited. Here's again a case of the family name disappearing. Joseph Corn or uh, James Corn had he, he James died, I think, in the 1840s. He didn't lived to be as old as the others did. But he, um, he had uh, three granddaughters. He had one son, and he also had, and I found this interesting, his daughter was named Lucinda. <laughs> I had not seen two. Sorry, you, you can't cover the mic. Um, so where your, your, where hand your hand is, Lucinda? You're covering the microphone that's pinned to your sweatshirt. Oh, shirt, oh. Right there. well, that's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can think of other things to do. But I, I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, some fella came around and asked, asked about the Cinder Cord. <laughs> I thought that was the first one. <laughs> I found out that after all, Bob's great-grandmother was it. Uh, Lucinda. Uh, but everybody called her Lucy, so I didn't know that. She was out Lucy Pinell Wall Corn. Now there's a lot of history about that I have recently discovered about the Wall children. But I probably mix you up if I, I'm still trying to stick to the corn. <laughs> But, uh, but you've been doing, you. it sounds like you've been really involved in um, genealogical studies and you make a point of tracking these uh, different branches of the family? Not necessarily. I, I don't care much for genealogy. Cindy, you get, don't cover the uh, microphone, I'm sorry. There's, um, I, I just, uh, one thing leads to another. And it's it's a very interest. I I find it very interesting, and I met some wonderful people. Uh, we had a. This is very modern history. But my husband's brother. Was still living. He died shortly after that, but he, he was a lot younger than Bob. He was born in. I think he was in high school. Your husband. Husband's father. Um, You're talking about Cal. Cal. Uh huh. And we had this uh, family thing, and a relative we had met came from uh, West Virginia, Charleston, and uh, he he was interesting. He has been back to see me two or three times. He's still living. And uh, his mother was a sister of, I mean, his ancestor, I should say, because I don't know how many generations it goes back. But I find everything is going back more generations <laughs> now than I like to think. But uh, he is descended from the same branch. But now I've also recently had contact with descendants of the Walls. There were two children by that name. And Lucy's first husband was killed in a, um, they were building a log cabin. And the axe head flew off and he was killed with that. So, and then he married a corn. That is, uh, she married a corn, I should say. And interestingly enough, this really gets confusing, but her, her daughter married the younger brother of John G. Corn. John G. Corn was Bob's ancestor, and so that all, all kind of confuses you. 
In fact, it confused us so much that in 70, 1972, I think it was after we had written the history, I said to Bob, let's go down to Greenbrier County and see if we can find out anything. Well, we got a telephone book there and found corns. So naturally, we got in touch. And, uh, but I never found out. They didn't know how they were connected. And we didn't, but I have since found out that they were connected to the uh, corns through this, this brother. And they had an Uncle Joseph in their family. <laughs> they talked about Uncle Joseph's farm. <laughs> And it, it's kind of confusing and interesting, but uh, it's what keeps you looking, I guess. I don't know where I was in the history of the family. I guess I mentioned. Then on the other side, a sister came here. Uh, Rachel, let's see. Married an Amy, I think his name was Jacob, and they had, a, like everybody else, a big, fairly big family. I, I'm not sure of all their family because I've never done any real genealogy on them. But the two that were important to the corn history, at least I found them so, were letters I found from. Hiram, who worked for the Chicago Fire Department and wrote us a letter after the Chicago Fire. And uh, I don't know where I get that. Was I, us stuff, I wasn't here. <laughs> but uh, I found that letter fascinating. Uh, I always remember finding it and reading it and thinking, oh, he, he started it with saying, well, you've all read and heard about the great fire we've had here. And I won't bore you with details. <laughs> and I kept saying to Bob, I wish he'd bore us. <laughs> but as he went on, then he talked more about the fire, too. Well, after all, it was his life. And his younger brother, uh, Myron Korn, wrote the Civil War letters that we had. He was with, uh, went through the South and and went with, I um, can't think of his name now, in the, oh, Sherman, Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, and uh, Myron was, I found a detail of this in a history that Myron Corn. this is Myron Amick. Uh, who had written these letters. And it seems like everybody who came here left something in the house <laughs> that, that you could use. It helped. And this is a history of the, I think it's the 36th Regiment uh, of the Civil War. And it tells about all the parts of the country they went through. And he was this, with the cavalry. Also, I can show it to you, maybe you'd like a picture of it, of the uh, letter that we have that shows uh, places that they had fought in. I think we have a letter from Rolla and we have one from Murfreesboro. I'm not, I'm not sure where are they all are. But anyway. Could, could we? Could we jump back to um, uh, maybe the building of the house here? Could you talk about oh, that a little bit? Oh, that was in 1850. They, we had a, a log cabin. Uh, I think it's down by the horse barn, where the horse barn used to stand. Um, and I remember this happened. I'm, I'm getting very personal. But we had a log cabin in our house woods when we were kids. I don't really remember it. My sister remembers much more of it than I do, but she doesn't do very much with <laughs> history, and so it's a little hard to get much from her. But she, uh, uh, the, I remembered when I was in sixth or seventh grade, we had a 
school teacher that was a neighbor, and she, I remember her saying to me, because I read a lot, she said, Lucinda, why did your father get rid of that log cabin? <laughs> well, anybody else could, couldn't say anything about my dad. Of course, I could say it. <laughs> but, but the fact that she said this in front of a bunch of kids bothered me. Well, I went home and I said, I asked my father why he got rid of the log cabin. Well, he said, we were pretty hard up. Elizabeth, I had a sister who was blind. Elizabeth was needed quite a bit in the way of medical work. And uh, so he said we were just hard up and we couldn't afford to fix it up. He said the log cabin had reached the point where it was falling apart and it was better to take it down than to just let it deteriorate uh, because it would have cost so much to have fixed it up. So they didn't do it. Well, I, years later, when I asked Grandpa Corn why they took the log cabin down, he gave me pretty much the same answer. They didn't have the money. They may have paid only a dollar and a quarter for the, the uh, acreage as they did here. Uh, but they still didn't have any money. And you read in their diaries things like four cents for a spool of thread, and what a job it was when they went to town to, to get the things that they needed because of the expense. And uh, so you wonder why there aren't more like cabins standing around. <laughs> but I think the last one I know of was up near Hampshire. Was one. But otherwise, they are a thing of the past. Anyway, the, this house uh, was built. Uh, Grandpa Corn said that when his father came from Virginia, he saw a house that looked something like this, I suppose, the, the pillars and the effect. I'm not sure, I've got plenty of books on it, but I don't remember what special style it was, but that was part of it. And he, um, he said that um, if he ever made it in Illinois, because everybody was going to get rich when they came to Illinois and started farming, even if they didn't know anything about farming. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, uh, if I ever make it, I'm going to build a house like that. And this house is a probably poor imitation of the Virginia homes. But he had remembered this house standing on the hill. And they spent four years in the building of it. The stone thresholds, you can see them there on, on the, the porch on the outside. Uh, is in the, and above the windows. You can see that in the old houses. The bricks were made on the place. Uh, that might be something for you to take a picture of sometime if you're interested. But the bricks on the porch, the porch was added on in 1925 when Cal was a baby. They enclosed the porch. That porch, not this one. But uh, you see these big stone slabs and I think they all came from, he had a team, oxen or horses. By 1850, he probably had horses. I don't think the oxen were used. I don't know that much about it, but uh, anyway, he came here with oxen. But I think that uh, that may have been the, by the time they had horses. And they'd take their team of horses and go places and work for a day. And I think he worked in the Batavia. I, don't, I shouldn't say he worked. Well, he probably did. <laughs> it was all hard work. But he uh, got the slabs from the Batavia quarry that were used in the basis of it. Actually, I don't know too much about 
the house except when I, after living here 50 years, I come to certain conclusions that are probably incorrect. But I think the kitchen was probably one of the last things. I remembered reading one of Amick's letters. He wrote the best letters. It's just a definite sense of humor. And he was a very good, but he'd tell us, uh, writing something like, I suppose you wonder why I haven't been, been to see you, but I don't like your muddy yards. <laughs> and I, I, I think little quirks like that always made me be impressed. Anyway, he, uh, I think that grandpa, Grandfather Corn probably thought, if you noticed when you came in the house, did you notice the window in the kitchen? Well, there's a window. Did you happen to notice it? There's a window right next to it. And you can see on the other side another window it, where a window was. Now it's a pantry. <laughs> but, but uh, and changes have been made on the inside. But other than the outside, the only thing that's changed is the, the enclosure of this porch over here. And it's the one that shows the bricks that were made on the, with the kiln on the place. Uh, with, and with the bricks that they tried to match, I think Grandpa Corn said they had to See, that was done in his day. And my husband remembered what a big thing it was when they enclosed the porch. I wish he were here to tell you these things, but he's been gone 20 years, so almost. But that's one of the reasons, I guess, he liked history, but he didn't. He was farming. He didn't have time to bother with it, I guess. And I don't think he knew what was in the attic. <laughs> Probably never did very much there. When you have a dairy, you don't do much else. Anyway, he, uh, I used to kid him and say, and when we were living up on the other place, we lived 10 years up there, I'd say, uh, well, uh, we're just camping out <laughs> till we can go back to the homestead. And that's the way he felt about the house. And that, uh, everything about the farm. Uh, he would not have appreciated what is happening to it any more than any of us do. None of us really wanted to give up. I've outlived my usefulness anyway, so it isn't so bad for me, but uh, Dave especially I feel sorry about because he really liked the farm and didn't go out of college. So anyway, no. that's enough personal history. There have been four to five generations that have grown up on this farm. Well, let's see. Grandfather Corn had the one. Grandpa Corn had Bob and Flora and Cal, the three. And Bob and I have had, but we, uh, we didn't live, the kids were all born when we were living down there. Uh, Grandma Corn died very suddenly, and uh, Grandpa lived seven years after she did. He was quite a bit older than she was, too, but he, uh, he was just a dear, sweet man, just a wonderful person. And I'm sure he was very quiet, and he was like my father. You'd ask him questions about things of history, and I did ask Grandpa a lot. I didn't delve into it till after he passed away because he was pretty choice about things that uh, he didn't want anybody nosing around or doing things. And I'm sure he would object to
to my shooting off my mouth about all this. <laughs> but it, he, he'd always say when I'd ask him something, oh, it seems like I heard something like that. <laughs> now, where do you go from there? <laughs> You're just at a dead end. And so I didn't really find out a lot from him. Grandma was different. She, you could talk to her about and she, But she got it all hearsay. It wasn't her family, actually, like mine. You, you had, I had written a, a muirhead history before I ever did anything with the corns as far as marrying. When some of my, and we had a big family. So where you have uh, aunts and uncles who are, or cousins who are older than your, your father, <laughs> it makes a difference. My father was the youngest in the family. And, but he was like grandpa. If you'd ask him something, he didn't know the answers. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he didn't want to or, or if they just, and they didn't talk much. I'm the one that talked a lot. I was always getting into trouble, and I still am. Um, something I'm curious about, Lucinda, is when um, Robert Sr.'s first wife passed away, uh -huh. and then he married... Um, Barbara Thompson. Yes. And you did say that um, she was quite a bit younger than he was. Yes. She, she was, ag from the, the birth dates, she was actually about the age of um, his, uh, Robert Corrin Sr.'s daughters. Mm -hmm. so she was born after he left. And see, he was 19 when he left. And she was born in Greenbrier County. Now, that's what I mean about the generations following. And, and when you came to places uh, that I'm sure you've seen it with Jerry, I don't know how many Swedish relatives he has, but I know a lot. And they came where there were a bunch of other Swedes. Yeah. In my case, my family came where there were Scotch people. I don't know if you're familiar with the... Uh, I think it's a fascinating place, but I don't know much about it. Over in Rutland Township, where they had the have the Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's a Scottish church, and they have services every year. Its church has been closed, but the cemetery is beautiful, and it's been kept up remarkably well. So if if you're ever out just for a ride, look it up. I think it has a white fence around, and it's on high, I believe Highland Avenue, but it's way out in the country. In fact, it's pretty close to Pingree, if you've ever heard of, of Pingree. <laughs> but uh, you have to go around about to get there. Anyway, that's aside from corn history, but it is an indication of how people went where they knew someone. Now, the, um, the corns, for some reason, and I think it was on the Pinell side of the family, uh, went to Niles, Michigan. So there must have been quite a clan there because James Corn came to Niles first. Joseph came to Niles first. But uh, it was Joseph who pioneered to the degree of coming out here first. And I... John Tucker was the name of the man. He was a brother-in-law of Joseph Corn, And it was his sister that Grandfather Corn. I don't know if you want all this, but that, that kind of indicates how families stayed together. They kept their customs. And you, you can see that. My sister married into the Swedish family, so... I know how important that is as far as foods and things are concerned. Somebody asked me, oh, one of our distant relatives who had married a German had 
lots of German cookery, and she said, uh, do you have any good Scottish <laughs> recipes? And I, <laughs> I wrote back and told her the only one I knew about was oatmeal. <laughs> but that was actually about all I, I did know, because my grandmother on my, mother, on my father's side died when she was uh, in her early 50s. And uh, she, uh, and on my, uh, the Richmond side, my grandmother was a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> so I think most of the things in cookery that my mother learned, she learned from her mother. And so you see, we didn't really have the Scottish uh, heritage. There were two mothers, and this is so often the case, two mothers in the family, where you had big families, but you had, may have a big one to start with, and you end up with a bigger one, <laughs> as my folks did. And my grandparents did. But I, 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 I don't know. I guess I'm just kind of fascinated by the past and the, all the things that, how things happened. You know, we talk about the, the courage of our ancestors and so on. I actually don't think it was courage. I don't think they knew what they were getting into. I know it took courage after they got here, but but I don't think they had any realization of what they were facing. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. I have trouble realizing it now as I think back of what has changed in the last century. Uh, what are... Um what are some of the changes in the last century that maybe like three or five of the major changes that that you've um, that have meant a lot to you? Well, I'd say it, everything does. I was born in 1909. I shouldn't tell this, but it's no secret. <laughs> uh, the uh, telephone. Maybe one family had a telephone, and everybody in the community used that telephone. Uh, I can remember Addie writing in, in her book how when they wanted the doctor, the doctor is in what is now Bowes Station, if you know where Bowes is. Yeah, it was just a railroad stop, but it had a doctor, and they'd call there, and... Uh, it called from here to get him, so the, the telephone was a big thing. Then, of course, well, there's so many things. No, I don't anymore. Um, I think that uh, you might say that uh, it was uh, the... World War One. I, I can only remember when they uh, had the celebration in Elgin when the war was over, November 11th. But uh, I know this is all Greek to you, but wars did date, they still do date a lot of things. And... Um, Along with it, the end of the war came so many modern conveniences. The automobiles had started, I think I was two when we had our first car. And uh, if you want to see our collection, Bob collected license plates from everywhere. Have you seen it? I've not seen it. I've heard about it. I would like to see that. Oh, it, it's, it's pretty good. He, he, anyway, we had our first car when I was around two. And then the auto, auto races in 1923 in Elgin, you may have heard of them. 
was a big thing. <laughs> and uh, I know I'm talking the past, but you're talking about things that have changed. And in 1933, the, the natives were so pleased with the Elgin Road races, they wanted to revive them. Well, by that time, it was impossible to re revive the, the races because it used part of 20. Where 20 comes into Elgin, uh, it was a five-mile route. You went around Highland Avenue and uh, uh, Larkin High School now. It was a big cow barn. And... Uh, that was the outskirts of the city. Now they're talking about Plato. <laughs> and uh, so there's so many changes that way. And then, of course, you can think of all the modern things, so many of them that I have no connection with, <laughs> don't know anything about. But television, oh, you shouldn't forget anyone of Swedish or Origin would never forget it. Lindbergh's a flight because after all, although they had had airplanes and motorized vehicles in World War I, it wasn't until he made that flight across the Atlantic that, that airplanes came into their own. And now, of course, We've gone through to the moon. <laughs> and when you think of all the things we've seen, it's kind of amazing. What other things have you seen? Okay, that's a good, I need to change tape.